Emergency Housing Authority regular meeting to order. Apologies for starting a few minutes late. Our closed session ran a bit longer than we expected. So uh, tonight, our Pledge of Allegiance is going to be led by the Experimental Aircraft Association, Chapter 20. So, gentlemen. Well, I have to admit, I was sort of hoping there'd be a drone or something flying around when you were doing that, but, but you know, maybe that's later. So, um, <clears throat> and we will give you a chance to speak in a, in a couple of minutes. So, uh, next item on the agenda is changes to the order of the agenda. Uh, Jeff and Greg, is there anything staff would suggest? Uh, nothing from staff this evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, is there anything that my colleagues would like to switch around on the agenda order? All right, then we will proceed with the agenda as published. Um, Greg, if you wouldn't mind doing the report from closed session. <clears throat> Briefly, there is no reportable action from closed session tonight. Someday, hopefully, you'll get a chance to actually say something on that item. Um, so that brings us to item five, a presentation, as I mentioned, from the Experimental Aircraft Association, Chapter 20, about their organization. I'm Oliver Coolidge. I'm the president of EAA Chapter 20. And I have with me Dave Bridger, who's our chief technical officer, and Jack Meadow, who's our scholarship recipient. Dave? Okay. Thanks, Oliver. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you know about the Experimental Aircraft Association. I remember years ago before I started flying that I thought it was a group of people that uh, made crazy designs and built them in their basement and then went out and foolishly flew them. And Experimental Aircraft Association is anything but that. It is an organization that is an advocate for uh, all kinds of aviation enthusiasts, people that fly airplanes that are built by the factories that you all know, like Cessna and Beechcraft, people that do fly, uh, experimental aircraft that were put together in kits by companies who have validated the design. So there are thousands of these airplanes out there flying uh, and are relatively safe because the instructions are, are quite good. And, and basically anybody that's interested in flying airplanes, fixing airplanes, building airplanes, the experimental Aircraft Association is an organization that people join to have camaraderie with people that enjoy aviation uh, and to learn more about it uh, in, in uh, any uh, direction that they're, they find interest. So one of the things we wanted to talk about a little bit is there's a national organization that was found in the early 50s. It's in Oshkosh. And uh, it, the one thing you might hear about EAA is people that go to a thing they call Oshkosh in Wisconsin. It's a one, once a year fly-in where they have something like 10,000 airplanes. It's, it's got, I, I haven't been, but it's, it's got to be a little bit of a chaotic event. Um, EAA is an international organization. There are 900 chapters in the United States. Uh, and there are over 200,000 members. When we think about our chapter, Chapter 20, that's at San Carlos Airport, uh, we have a, you know, a group of people that is, is growing, and we're proud to say that we're bringing in a lot of young people. Part of our mission is to introduce young people to aviation, uh, into the engineering side, into the flying side, into anything to do uh, with, with uh, aerospace. And so, you know, part of, our, part of our mission and part of the fun is introducing young people to aviation. One of the things I think we're most proud of is a thing called Young Eagles. At, at its top level, Young Eagles is a once a month uh, uh, collection of people coming together, young people from ages of eight to 17, and we take them on orientation flights. So they get to see 
what it's like to fly in a small airplane. I get to see what it's like to fly around the skies around San Carlos. But the Young Eagles is more uh, a broad scale than that. When we register these uh, Young Eagles, uh, they get to become student members of EAA. They can get a free uh, uh, first lesson in an in a airplane with a real instructor. Uh, they can get access to many museums uh, throughout the United States uh, and other ways to get them more engaged in aviation. So you see some pictures here of uh, students that we take up. And again, these uh, students are, are uh, taken up once a month on the third Saturday. And in the last uh, time we did this, we had over 40 uh, young eagles who were going up for their first flight in their life in a small airplane. Another activity that a number of us are involved with is, is building an experimental airplane. And so we've got a couple of pictures here to, just to give you an idea of what's going on. We started this process almost three years ago. Uh, whenever you talk to anybody about their experience building an airplane, they'll tell you it takes a long time. You know, we thought maybe we'd be done in two years. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit more than three years by the time we're done. And you can kind of see the, uh, the way the, the airplane comes together. Everything comes in boxes, delivered on a you know, big flatbed truck. Uh, in the middle picture, you can see uh, progress about where we are today. We've got you know, basically all the components pretty much in place. Uh, and shortly, we're gonna take it to a paint uh, shop and it won't exactly look like the airplane that's in yellow. Uh, we'll have a different color scheme, but that's a finished RV-12 from Vans uh, that we're gonna build and fly locally here in San Carlos. Part of our dedication to the youth and introducing people to aviation is scholarships. Uh, every year we send students to Air Venture and they go to Air Academy, which is a, uh, it's a week long uh, camp, if you will, for those students. They learn about uh, airplanes, aerospace, engineering, a broad swath of things, plus they get some rides and some airplanes. So they, they are really excited about it. Uh, Elizabeth Antoine Hands went in 2018. We had two people go this year, 2019, and we're planning on sending five people next year. The gentleman on my left over here, Jack Meadows, is the first recipient of uh, the Ray Aviation Scholarship for Chapter 20. This is the first year they've done it. Uh, the Ray Foundation donates a uh, million dollars a year. Uh, there were about 90 chapters that uh, won scholarships, uh, so we were one of 90. And again, there's about a, you know 900 chapters total, so we feel very fortunate that we were able to do that. Uh, you know, Jack is now in flight training. He's going to ground school, and he's starting to get some flight hours. And not too distant future, he'll be soloing. Um, some may I ask you to? Uh, uh uh, move towards wrapping up, please. Sure. Thank uh, you. And, and maybe this is really the last slide. One of the, one of the things we do on a monthly basis is we have uh, a chapter meeting. We bring in guest speakers. You know, a couple of the speakers that, you know, we found really exciting is a, a pilot that was in SR-71s. And we've gotten a number of, of uh, uh, presentations on electric airplanes. There's quite a few companies that are uh, invested in that uh, activity. So I'll wrap it up right there and uh, let you get on with the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming to educate us. That was really wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I, I do have to say, since I learned about your organization through my neighbor, uh, Colonel Bumgarten, um, just be careful with him. He's a chopper pilot, and you know those guys are crazy. Okay, so I do know about chopper pilots, and you're right. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> All right, uh, that moves us on to <clears throat> item six, which is public comment. This is a period of time when members of the public who wish to address the council on items that are not on the agenda are free to do so. Uh, anybody wishing to address us on an item that is on the agenda, we will provide time on each of the items for people to do that. Uh, I don't actually have any speaker cards for this section. Crystal, did we get any for section six? Um, 
looking out at the audience, there doesn't appear to be anybody jumping up, so we will pass on through the public comment item. That brings us to uh, item seven, council communications and announcements. Um, does anybody have anything they would like to add or like to say? Adam, it looks like your light's on. Sure, I just wanna uh, mention I attended the CCAG meeting last week and we uh, discussed the Sabrina and the numbers that we'd get for housing and ultimately the county staff and CCAG staff presented us with one option which was to not form a subregion and to um, just work collaboratively within the county to try and come up with some research and share some information, work with community development directors. Thank you, Adam. Laura. Thank you, Chair Olbert. Uh, just to report out, I attended the city, um, the Council of Cities dinner at Belmont uh, recently, which was a very nice affair over at the Volkswagen of America um, uh, design facility, and then also attended the Peninsula Clean Energy Strategic Planning meeting a couple Saturdays ago uh, to learn about uh, po uh, potential aspects that would concern our, the procurement of uh, electricity in the near future, so that was very interesting. Thank you, uh, anybody else? Uh, in that case, I have uh, a brief comment to add. Um, I was in between our this meeting and our prior one, uh, I was on a kind of a whirlwind trip back to New England and New York City visiting uh, our daughter and uh, going to a 40th year, 40th anniversary grad school reunion and visiting the city of Boston. So I thought it would be nice to bring back a little memento for my colleagues, um, but I really wasn't sure what to do until we happened to go to uh, Sleepy Hollow where Washington Irving lived. That's actually near where I grew up. Um, and uh, I was in the gift shop there and I saw the perfect gift which I've brought back for everybody. Um, since almost any significant decision we make, um, there's always somebody in the community who thinks we've lost our minds. Um, I thought when I saw these, it would be very appropriate. These are headless horsemen snow globes. So um, if you're ever in any doubt, you can tell people that apparently it's possible to ride a horse without a head. So uh, you know maybe it's possible to work on the council without a head too. So. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Chair. It's better than candy. <laughs> <laughs> Less fattening, too. Um, okay, that brings us to the consent calendar. Uh, these are items that the council generally enacts en masse, although individual council members can ask that items be pulled so that they are addressed separately. Uh, they, the consent calendar is usually also um, acted upon without discussion. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar or are there items that somebody would wish to remove to be considered separately? I move to approve city council consent calendar items A through F and item G adopting ordinance number 1552 and ordinance of the city council of the city of San Carlos approving a zoning map amendment to rezone the project site at 1091 Industrial Road, APN 046-151-060 from plan development to com general commercial industrial and rescinding the plan development permit. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second. Uh, Crystal, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Parmer Lohan? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. And Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Okay, so the consent calendar passes. That brings us to item nine, uh, 9A, a study session. Discuss and provide direction on increasing child care facilities in San Carlos. Good evening, Al. Good evening, Martin. Good evening, Chair and members of the City Council. And what I'd like to do is provide a brief introduction and talk about the outline of the presentation this, this evening and make a few introductions before we begin. In late 2017, the Council directed City staff to explore some options to address the child care issue in our community. And staff at that time presented some preliminary options and strategies to help with that in our community. Staff also met with a parent group and child care providers. In mid-2019, the council reprioritized the issue. And uh, since that time, staff has consulted with some key stakeholders. We've talked to San Mateo County and the San Carlos School District to share information, gather data, 
and look for partnerships. And in addition to that, we recently met with the City Council Child Care Subcommittee of the Council, uh, Chair Olbert and Council Member Rack. So as we move into um, our discussion, what we'd like to do tonight is outline the issue and go back through and, and refresh our um, understanding of the issue and what some of the um, information is, the data is surrounding child care in San Carlos, and also talk about some of the constraints that we've heard from people, parents, and operators in our community. And then uh, finally, present some regulatory and financial options for your consideration. And tonight, um, what we'd like to do is seek your guidance on where you would like to move forward on some of the things you see and, and have a discussion about some of these things. Andrea Martisich, our senior planner, will pre be presenting the outline of the issues and discussing constraints. We'll have Martin Romo, our economic development and uh, housing manager talk about the regulatory and financing options. And we also have Sarah Kinahan with the Build Up San Mateo County, and this is San Mateo County's child care initiative, so she's here. And we have Ashley Kanat with EPS, our economics consultant, and we're all available to answer questions of the council and the public. So with that, I'm going to introduce Andrea. Good evening, council members. I'm Andrea Martisich, senior planner. We wanted to start this evening with an understanding about what the need is for child care within the city. This is based on a recent analysis done this month of supply and demand for child care within San Carlos. There's currently a need for 1,167 preschool spaces and 247 infant spaces. The supply, however, is much less than that. The supply of uh, preschool spaces is at, uh, sorry, 685 and 125 for infant. So adding those all together, there is a total shortage of 604 childcare spaces within San Carlos. When we talk about childcare, there's two types of uh, categories that we're talking about. The first are in-home facilities, so small and large uh, in-home daycares. Uh, we have about 19 of those in San Carlos. They are not shown on this map because their location uh, is not allowed to be publicized. Um, so this map really reflects our commercial child care facilities. And on this map, we have daycare centers, uh, school-age daycare centers, and those are the, um, the care centers at the public school and the charter learning center, and then infant care centers. And so those are all shown on this map. And going specifically into commercial daycare facilities, uh, we wanted to talk about facility costs. So in terms of these, uh, San Mateo County research indicates that building a new child care facility and a commercial child care facility is estimated at about $43,000 per child, so per space for uh, the commercial daycare center. In terms of ongoing costs on the operational side, there are about 60 to 80% of the center's costs are, are attributed to labor. And you can see on this chart uh, that the living wage for an adult in the county is at about $33 an hour. However, all of the child care positions which are listed above that and include uh, site supervisors and directors are significantly below that amount. Uh, to the right, you can see the percentage turnover rate for each position, and you'll notice that uh, the lower the wage, the higher the turnover rate. These costs are then passed on to parents uh, as part of their monthly tuition or fees. A fiscal year uh, 18 and 19 regional market survey by the California Department of Education identified the cost of parents in San Carlos, uh, and these range, uh, these differ depending on the type of center. For child care commercial centers, they range from $1,358 to $1,820 a month. And then for family child in home care, they range from $1,194 to $1,227 a month. 
During this time, staff has been meeting with stakeholders and they've really identified three, three areas um, that are, are the biggest concern to them and the biggest constraint. And these include regulations, uh, financial hurdles, as well as process time. We also wanted to review uh, a background and kind of an idea of what our peer cities do in terms of childcare. Redwood City, South San Francisco, and San Mateo have pretty robust child care programs. They're all housed in their parks and recreation departments. They have user-friendly web pages with in-depth child care information. They have more flexibility in their zoning, which allows, uh, which allows more districts to have child care facilities. Redwood City currently waives planning fees for large in-home child care facilities, and San Mateo allows large in-home child care facilities by right in residences. Uh, both of these last two points um, will, will become moot points uh, after the passage of SB 234, which will prohibit uh, fees as well as um, use permits for in-home facilities. So as of this point, um, they are waiving that, but, but it will be required for all jurisdictions within the state. Similar to San Carlos, child care policies uh, and programs in Belmont and Foster City uh, have restrictive zoning and a lack of informational web pages to provide helpful resources. In terms of a brief summary of requirements to operate for in-home providers, there are maximum child to provider ratios. The operator must live at the residence. Uh, for large family daycare, there are minimum outdoor requirements. Employees are required to do background checks, training, CPR, and first aid. And then there's initial and annual inspections by the state. For commercial child care centers, uh, there's also teacher and child ratios, minimum of 35 square feet per child for indoor area and 75 square feet per child for, of outdoor area. Uh, kitchen or food prep area is required. There's designated indoor play and sleeping spaces. They must have direct access to an enclosed outdoor play area. They must comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And again, the same employee requ requirements of background checks and training. Um, and in some cases for the, the commercial centers, uh, there's also educational requirements uh, for the, the supervisors um, and teachers aides and things like that. And lastly, I wanted to bring up an additional constraint um, that when it comes to siting daycare centers, and that's this idea of sensitive receptors. Uh, this is a term that's used to describe uses that are sensitive to noise, odor, and particulate matter, um, and also, of course, contaminated sites. Uh, sensitive receptors include housing, hospitals, convalescent centers, schools, and daycare facilities. We generally see this term used in air quality or CEQA analysis, uh, when the city has to determine whether a new project is going to have an impact on a sensitive receptor. San Carlos also has general plan language that limits the location of these sensitive uses uh, near industrial areas. We wanted to highlight this issue uh, because there's this added level of complexity uh, when it comes to siting daycare, especially if you were interested in opening up zoning districts where child care could be allowed. Uh, we wanted to, to bring this up as well. And with that, I will hand it over to Martin Orton. Good evening, Chair Albert and members of the City Council. Uh, Martin Romo, Economic Development Housing Manager. So at this point, we'd like to discuss regulatory and financing options um, that aim to increase childcare spaces. So beginning with in-home family childcare homes, uh, family childcare homes are facilities that provide childcare services in existing residential areas and are categorized as either small, which is up to eight spaces, or large, which is up to 14 spaces, um, and are defined as family childcare homes. Currently, our zoning ordinance regulates these two types of family childcare homes differently. Small family childcare homes um, are allowed by right whereas large family childcare homes require a minor use permit. Um, as mentioned before, this passage of Senate Bill 234, which was signed by government, Governor Newsom recently, will preempt the city from being able to impose this minor use permit requirement and will treat large family childcare homes um, as similar to the small childcare homes as of uh, January 2020. In meetings with stakeholders, uh, fees and permitting process were identified as a constraint to expand or establish new facilities. 
Uh, while SB 234 is going to be able to preempt the city from collecting permit fees or business license fees um, for both the large and small child care homes, commercial child care facilities and those operators will still be subject to some of these fees. Uh, in zoning districts that will require use permits, such as a minor use permit or a conditional use permit, these can be significant costs um, that cause a burden to operators to open new facilities. Minor use permits can cost about $2,500 and conditional use permits are about $5,000. And then depending on the facility requirements, there may be some additional fees associated with interdepartmental review, um, either from fire, public works, or the departments in the city. So council may opt to reduce or waive fees for commercial child care centers, such as was recently done by the council in waiving transportation impact fees for daycare centers. Zoning standards, such as requirements related to outdoor space, noise and circulation were cited as barriers to the permitting process. The council may opt to direct staff to review the adopted standards for daycare uses um, and recommend changes that may relax requirements and facilitate the creation of new spaces. Uh, similarly, council may opt to expedite the application process for child care facilities, um, which operators noted could be could take longer than um, than is optimal. The stakeholders we engaged identified zoning districts restrictions as an issue in the city. Uh, going back to SB 34, which permits in-home family daycare by right in all residential districts moving forward, it does not address commercial daycare facilities, which cities may still regulate at the local level. This chart on the left illustrates the city's 21 zoning districts, which span from RS3, our lowest density residential district, to commercial and industrial districts. Uh, as you can see, uh, the zoning ordinance currently only permits daycare centers as a use by right in one of the 21 districts in the city, and that's the mixed use downtown district. Some of the other districts that provide uh, or permit this use uh, through a minor use permit, such as your mixed use districts, uh, do require that extra um, level of review through the minor use permit process. So with this, council may direct staff to review the current land use regulations and study possible amendments for childcare as a use in other districts, either by right or through a use permit. Another regulatory option that is available is a policy directive for development agreements. Uh, new large scale development is likely to increase demand for childcare space here in the city and these developments are likely to enter into development agreements with the city. The city council may opt to include or prioritize child care facilities as an item for negotiation uh, of community benefits through the development agreement process. Moving to some of the financial options, special taxes may be explored that earmark funds for the creation of additional childcare spaces. A citywide parcel tax or sales tax could be proposed to fund childcare facilities. Examples of special taxes include um, a sales tax increase. For example, West Sacramento voters increased their sales tax by uh, 0.125% to fund preschool programs. Um, a tobacco product tax or uh, a good example is Los Angeles, which charges a 50 cent per cigarette pack uh, to fund preschool programs. Um, and a property tax set aside, the, the city of San Francisco sets aside 4% for preschool programs. Another financial tool that could be implemented is the development impact fee. And this would impose a one-time charge on new development for the creation of child care facilities. This would, uh, by conducting a nexus study and determining what amount to set the new impact fee at. Um, the city would charge these on a, either a per square foot basis or for residential uh, projects on a per unit basis. And the, the proceeds from this fee program would be deposited into a child care facility trust fund. Uh, those proceeds could then be used either as grants or as low interest loans for establishing or expanding child care facilities in the city. Beyond the regulatory and financial options, we would also like to highlight a couple other options that the council may consider. Currently, childcare is not an identified policy objective of the city. Some cities have incorporated childcare as official policy in city visioning documents, such as Redwood City, which made childcare a general plan goal in 1990, and has created specific staff positions, such as childcare coordinator. Other cities have created divisions within their parks departments to manage childcare facilities and to meet their city goals and objectives. 
should the council choose to do so. Uh, child care could be identified as a policy goal and can be incorporated into the general plan, the parks master plan, the economic development plan, and other citywide visioning documents. Given that, this, that child care is not an identified city policy objective, the city's website currently does not offer information on child care for parents or for operators. A detailed web page could be created that provides easily digestible information regarding the process and requirements for establishing a child care facility. Staff could also develop a map of existing facilities for public access and could produce literature specific to the city uh, on how to open and expand uh, facilities here in town. So there are several other organizations that have complementary policy goals when it comes to child care, um, which dovetail with the city's current efforts. The County of San Mateo through its Build Up Initiative, the San Carlos School District, nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, child care operators, parents, and several other community stakeholders. These are all potential uh, partnerships that could coalesce and work together towards providing additional child care space. So to summarize the options laid out in these previous slides, we've organized them into these th three columns here, regulatory, financial, and other options, and have identified with a star some options that could be adopted expeditiously. Um, as Al mentioned, staff is seeking for guidance following council's discussion to determine which of these options to further study and calendar for potential adoption as policy at a subsequent meeting. Um, and we do have Ashley Kanat, the city's child care consultant, Sarah Kinahan from County's Build Up Initiative, and city staff, uh, which will be available for questions you may have. So thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Um, and by the way, uh, Andrea and Sajuti, I apologize for not mentioning you when Martin, when I mentioned Martin and Al as well before. Thank you for being here. Just, I guess Martin was sitting in the back of the room and he walked up, so I saw him. So sit in the back next time. No, just kidding. Um, so uh, before we do uh, council questions, I have a few speaker cards and I, I thought we'd go through those first and then go into questions. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, call people up one by one and uh, ask you to please remember that um, there's a timer on the, the podium. It's set for two minutes. If you can please try and hold your comments for two minutes, we'd appreciate that. Again, I have three cards. If there's anybody else who wants to address the council, uh, please feel free to fill out a card and give it to Crystal. So first up is Kristen Anderson. Good evening, Kristen. Good evening. I'm Kristen Anderson, a child care planning and policy consultant with the Build Up for San Mateo County's Children Initiative, and that's actually a collaborative project of the county, first five, uh, the County Office of Education, the child care foresees the Child Care Resource and Referral Agency, and the Silicon Valley Community Foundation working on the shortage of facilities in our county. Um, as I've also been the Redwood City Child Care Coordinator part-time for many, many years, and, um, and have also helped several San Carlos providers over the years as they've not been able to find space in Redwood City to open a program, but have come to other communities. And so I'm somewhat familiar with some of the uh, programs that have lost space here or had permitting problems. Um, you've had a great presentation from your staff tonight, and I think it's particularly helpful to look at some of the short-term, easier steps to take, which I think are really excellent. Looking at um, what other cities have done in the county is, is very helpful. City of South San Francisco and San Mateo are the only ones with developer impact fees. Um, I helped with the South San Francisco one about 20 years ago, and they used that funding to create new facilities that they operate uh, their own child care in. Um, in Redwood City, we have about 400 child care spaces in the pipeline in addition to the 120 spaces that opened at the Stanford campus in Redwood City a couple of weeks ago. So we have some large mixed use and housing projects, including Arroyo Green, the mid pen project that's under construction downtown that's senior affordable housing with child care space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is David Fleischman. Do 
Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Olbert and council members and the community. I'm David Fleischman. I'm executive director of Four Cs, the Child Care Coordinating Council of San Mateo County. I'm a member of the Build Up Leadership Team, and I'm a member of the Child Care Partnership Council. Uh, I'm here basically to thank you for taking this up and taking it so seriously and to offer any help that I or my agency or Build Up or the Child Care Partnership Council uh, can provide. Uh, as I think you all know, the first years are the most important in a child's life in terms of determining the long-term outcomes, school success. Um, it's also the least well compensated, as you saw, that not a single position offers a living wage, yet it's still 60 to 80% of operating costs. And you have a shortage here in your city. Um, so uh, I encourage you to uh, reduce the fiscal zoning and administrative constraints. You got a lot of good star options up there that seem to be uh, able to be expeditiously put into place. Um, a lot of the cities, as you see, are doing wonderful work and doing wonderful work countywide, and San Carlos, I think, should step up and be a, a leader alongside of them. And so I just urge you, as much as you're able, and I know it's not a, a issue without complication, uh, to act uh, as much as you can to increase uh, the amount of childcare that's available to the residents of San Carlos and act as much as you can be in a way that will not be an impediment to the establishment of, of new facilities. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, next up is, uh, apologies if I get the name wrong. Oh, no, I know this name, Robert Stafford. The Robert was a little unclear to me tonight, so. Good evening, Chair, members of the Council, uh, staff. I think, first of all, staff has done a great job articulating uh, a blueprint, a blueprint for a wider expansion. If you draw a simple Venn diagram, and on the left-hand side, you put policy, in the middle, you put place. On the right-hand side, you put personnel for execution. What you would say is this is a perfect opportunity to redefine what is a public benefit. When you look at SB 50, it was a sledgehammer, but it's coming back. I wouldn't underestimate uh, Governor Newsom to come back with something more adroit. I think towns like San Carlos are well positioned to have a scorecard of, hey, we're not gonna go carve up the middle of a residential neighbor, but we can provide daycare. And I think staff has given you guys the guidance as whether you have the heart to do it. When you ask yourself, why hasn't it been done? Well, the stakeholders take long naps during the day, right? The parents are frazzled. They soil themselves. I mean, this is not good. They're, they're interested for a couple years and they go, ah, sh this isn't going to work. They'd go somewhere else like most people do. They drive two and three towns. Consistent with climate change is having it in your own town. You're not gonna tax your way out of it or your fee. These are bold moves. Look at the zoning map. What works is mixed use in parks. Look at the tremendous job Arbor School does. Be interesting to ask those teachers how many of them have daycare. Arbor School is your blueprint. If you go on the other side of Woodland, there's enough space there for daycare. Think of Stanford and the 99-year leases. West side is where daycare belongs. I think staff pointed out why it doesn't work on the east side. It's a patchwork of pollutants. Most people go up to 280. West side doesn't share in the infrastructure. Go up on Crestview. There's two parcels up there that could be used. So when you look at schools, ah, probably not gonna happen. When you look at General Assembly, challenging. General Assembly use is dropped precipitously. People don't go to church, synagogue, or anything the way they used to. So you would think that that would be a good place, but go to Arroyo, and the side yard setback was increased from five to 20 feet. Why? Because the intolerance for nonprofits and General Assembly has gone up while the use has gone down. Why? because you're, you're letting policy be Robert, guided. could you move to wrapping up, please? I'll move to wrapping up, which is you guys have a great opportunity, you have a great heart. If you thought of this as a special needs child, you would hold it and solve the problem. Thank you, sir. Um, next up is, uh, the next card I have is Sarah Kinahan. If there's anybody else who would like to address us, please, as I said, fill out a card and give it to Crystal. 
Uh, good evening, Chair and members of the Council. Uh, I would ditto many of the points that have already been made to you. I especially want to give kudos to the staff for uh, distilling a really complicated topic into a really excellent PowerPoint that we might want to steal for other cities. Um, oh, and just to back up and introduce myself, I'm Sarah Kinahan. I am a San Carlos resident and parent. I'm a consultant to the Build Up Initiative, and I'm also the interim coordinator for the Child Care Partnership Council which is the county's local planning council for child care. Uh, so I will just make two additional points. Uh, one is hearkening back to how 60 to 80 percent of the costs of operating a child care program are labor, and the higher quality of the program, the more staff you employ, and the more those impact the costs. And then thinking about the wages of those teachers and how hard it is for those low-income workers to stay in our county. And so so if we're trying to connect the dots with other issues in our city, such as housing and the cost of living, uh, to consider the, the workers in the child care centers. Uh, and lastly, I will just uh, reiterate that BuildUp really sees faith-based programs as a key partner in this, um, as they have space potentially, and as the last speaker mentioned, there may be declining use of those faith-based programs, um, but this is a really wonderful partnership in mission uh, where a church may be able to bring in a child care operator, serve some of the needs of the community, and generate some additional revenue, and BuildUp is happy to help make those kind of partnerships. Thank you for studying this tonight. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, as far as licensing our intellectual property, you can talk to Jeff. Our rates are quite reasonable. Um, next up is uh, Brian Perkins. Good evening, Brian. Good evening. I actually wasn't going to say anything until I heard the final speaker there. Um, Brian Perkins, St. Francis Way. I, the, the ideas that have come up are terrific, and I hope the, um, the council will adopt them. They do strike me, though, as temporary measures, and you know they're the easier ones to do, obviously, the waiving of the fees, if that's easy, and so forth. The longer-term issue is the one that the last speaker just spoke about, and that is wages and the cost of housing. And so I hope that somewhere along the line of this discussion, if not tonight, then, other way, uh, then some other time, we start to talk about that, because... We don't have child care workers who can stay in this community. I happened to visit one in Belmont, a child care provider in Belmont. She used to regularly recruit from South San Jose. That's not working anymore. And it's not working not just because the economy is good, it's because the wages just simply don't match up with the cost of housing, even in the city of South San Jose. So I hope the council will take a really serious look at that. We need affordable housing within the community to deal with the cost structure of these organizations. And then we have a couple of other opportunities as well that aren't covered up here. At one point in my career, when I worked in the legislature, we were able to organize a workers' comp pool, which uh, lowered the cost of workers' comp insurance for child care providers. It doesn't take um, the child care providers themselves to do that. Some organization like the city could sponsor a talk about that and try and lower not only that cost, but other costs as well, such as costs of health care. And we could talk a little bit at some point about how the county of San Mateo has lowered its own costs of health care for similar sorts of workers. So I hope you'll adopt whatever's here tonight, and then I hope you'll go down to the next step and start to really push the, uh, push the envelope a bit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Is there anybody else who wishes to address the council on this topic? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll turn it back to uh, council um, initially questions of staff and then we'll get into discussion and feedback to staff. So uh, folks, Sarah, looks like your light came on first. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a question for staff. I noticed in the packet that we receive about 20 to 30 inquiries per year from child care operators. Are those mostly from family home daycare operators or child care centers? Uh, so most of those are, it actually kind of varies. So um, in the last few years, they've been more commercial uh, inquiries, and a large percentage of those were ones that had lost or were losing their space and trying to find locations. Um, we do pretty regularly, and I'd say, um, you know, a few times a month get get sort of general inquiries about family um, 
uh, family and home care, uh, but with those ones, because they're allowed by right and the smaller ones in our districts, we don't have as much interaction other than telling them you know, where to go to do it. Um, so I would say the, the commercial ones are the ones that we have the more interaction with, um, but I'd say it's, it's pretty even in terms of the numbers of each. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, I have one additional question on SB 234, which um, preempts the city from imposing minor use permits. As part of that process, is that part of the um, the neighborhood meeting um, requirement? Is that part of the permitting process? And so under SB 234, that will go away? That's correct. Um, and we will also, uh, so right, I mentioned earlier that we don't always know where all the in-home um, providers are located. As part of that, uh, the larger uh, in-home daycare not only don't have to apply for a minor use permit, um, there's no requirement for a hearing, and um, they don't necessarily, they don't need a business registration either from the city. Um, so we're gonna, you, you know, we won't necessarily know where they're all, all located. Okay, thank you. Laura. Uh, thank you, Chair Albert. So a couple of questions. Um, with the uh, in-home daycare, it talked about the fact that there was a minimum uh, requirement for um, outdoor space uh, in, the, in the homes. And do you happen to know what that requirement is and whether? Not for the larger ones. Okay, not so for, for sorry, for family daycare, there is not that requirement. Not, okay, I thought yeah. that, was, um, that was puzzling to me. Okay, and then uh, with respect to, there's two options that you pre uh, talked about. One was around, um, on slide number 20, the constraint is no child care facility development impact fees and uh, potentially establishing a child care facility trust fund. And then on slide 18, you talk about um, entering into development agreements. Could you talk a little bit more about what the differences are between the two? I'm getting a little bit lost on this second one on slide 20. I'll defer to Martin. Um, to go back to your earlier question, one thing I wanted to say is mm -hmm. our municipal code requires outdoor space um, for the in-home, so that's something that, that would not be compliant with the state law. Okay, yeah. and what is, that, what is that requirement? I believe it's 75 square feet per child. For, for the larger in home. Per child. Per child. Oh, that's a lot for the lots that we have. Thanks. So on this slide, the child care uh, facility development impact fee would be a new fee program. And so it would be, let's take perhaps $1 per square foot of new office development. And those proceeds would be then uh, deposited into a, this facility trust fund which then could be used either to create grant program or to offer some sort of low interest loan um, to operators who want to expand or create new space. Um, and so those funds would uh, be only on new development on a one-time charge. Um, and then that's a little different from the development agreement process um, in the sense that the development agreement process is just a negotiated process with staff and a developer of a particular site. Um, so while it may be the case that uh, a a project that would be subject to the development impact fee um, ultimately goes into the develop to a development agreement process. It's not it's not required that they do. So it might be that you set up a fee program and some projects will pay into that fee, um, and then it, and it may be the case that other projects move into the development agreement. Phase so depending upon the size of the project, they might. It's either or, depending upon the type of project. That's right. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, going back to something that uh, Sarah was asking about with respect, because I'm trying to wrap my head around capacity. So if we were to implement these changes that you have that have been starred, the low-hanging fruit, um, my general concern based on what you just shared with Sarah is that even if we do these things, it won't necessarily mean that we're going to increase right. capacity. So. Um, by my calculation, so for example, if most of those 20 to 30 requests that were coming in per year um, would be able to go through with the results of some of these changes, we would hit about two thirds of the gap, meet two thirds of the gap. But given the fact that the most of the people that are coming to us are these commercial facilities, what can you tell me on here would help? It seems to me it's the zoning issue that's potentially getting in the way more so than um, the in-home facilities. Is that, tr is that correct? So when we met with um, the stakeholders, we heard both. You know, it's both expensive to create the facilities and um, 
the limited locations where they can go tend to be the locations that are already more expensive for land or rental rates. Um, and so maybe just going back to this slide that show where um, commercial child care facilities are permitted by right, um, you know, you can see that there are certainly opportunities here to expand uh, to the different mixed use districts um, that could be all permitted, not necessarily subject to the minor use permit. And then perhaps uh, studying deeper the different designations to see if uh, it's appropriate to some of these prohibited spaces to, um, you know, to have this use, like the mixed use downtown core. Um, it's not immediately clear to me why it's prohibited there, but you know, looking into that, that may, there may be a locations there that an operator has seen as a location that they could go and when they come to the planning counter to, to see if they can get a zoning clearance for that particular parcel that they've identified, they find out that it's a prohibited space and they have to go back to looking for another space. So we just have limited, limited existing stock um, for, for operators to go and rent out of a, a location where they could create a new center. Um, and then the centers, and then the space that is available tends to be the more expensive space in town. Um, so then it kind of begs the question of either we need to create a program where there's grants or low interest loans, whatever, some sort of financial assistance to help reduce the cost and the expense of land or perhaps identify new land which is more affordable and then find some kind of lever that would help to balance out those two issues. Thank you, Martin. Adam. Thank you, Chair Obert. Um, so I think I had questions maybe for, for both of you, so I can start with you, Martin, if that works. Um, so I guess, can you tell me a little bit about, so I saw that the idea of sort of waiving certain fees, can you just give me a sense of how much of a sort of, I know you touched a little bit on this with, uh, with Laura, but on the minor use and conditional use permit, I mean, how much of an impact that is and from a cost perspective for some of these commercial uh, daycare centers? Yeah, so the average is for opening up a per space facility is 40 grand. Um, and let's say there's, you know, about 20, 20, a 20 space facility that wants to go in. Uh, the minor use permit itself um, will be about 2,000, and if it's a conditional use permit site, then it would be about 5,000 just to get the use permit approved. Um, but if they're building a new facility, um, you know, we have the traffic impact fee wave now, which is a significant fee, but there are sewer connection fees, there are several other departmental fees for new construction or for getting a, a site built out. Um, so I, it, it, because it's also site specific and project specific, it's hard to give you a percent of total development cost, you know, whether it be 15%, 10%, um, but it has been identified by the stakeholders, um, uh, by the operators that the costs are high for the locations where, that, where they've looked for space to go into. And so they've, you know, having them reach out to us and ask for, and seek relief indicates to us that they're sufficiently high enough that they can't open in these locations. Okay. Um, and then I guess the next couple of questions, I have a quick one just or for Andrea. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about, I know you talked about the cost of the 43,000 for per facility, I think there was a number, or per child to open. What, what's the average number that we're looking at for in the city for these commercial centers? We have an idea of sort of, are they 50 kids, 30 kids, 20 kids? Oh, in terms of size, I'm not sure. Do you have the information? Do you know what the average is for, for those child care centers? I can give you more. So I don't have the average number, um, but what I can tell you is that it depends uh, greatly on the amount of staff they have. So for the commercial centers, um, the amount of children that they're able to uh, accommodate depends on how many teachers and aides they have. So if you have a center with, let's say, two teachers, then you can have about 18 children. Um, I know we've had one center that wanted to expand, um, and I know that centers that provide infant care can actually provide less spaces than if they were to provide um, you know, preschool care. So I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but that's something that we could figure I'd, out and I'd get back curious yeah. in terms of the size and capacity on that and then secondly I, I know you at the beginning you talked about sort of the in-home and commercial child care centers and uh, I know the school district has a significant number of that do we know what percentage of the supply is, is taken up by the school district right now so of these 19 um, about the total 1400 or the uh, 1400 that we have or, oh, the, the, or the 800 that we have how many 
Yeah, so of the spaces, I don't know the amount that are the school district. In terms of sites, they are almost half because a lot of the schools have the preschool right. um, as well as the after school care. And, oh, I see. Um, so you're including, including after school as part of this. Exactly. So um, some are, are private companies, but located at school sites. Thank you. Ron. Uh, thank you, Mark. Not sure who this is for. Maybe Martin. State law. Um, so what is the impact of state law in terms of where child care centers can go? Is, I, I noticed that there's the one there that the one that shows a commercial daycare zoning district. Um, they're prohibited in a lot of areas. Is that due to local law? Or Andrea, maybe too. <laughs> it, or is it due to state law? Uh, w w w what is the regulatory obstacle? And so, where is that? So the, uh, the state law really applies to the in-home. Um, the in-home uses. The municipal code had some requirements. For example, if you want to move to a sm from a small in-home to a large, it's re it requires a use permit. Um, so a state law that was passed, I think was about a year ago, said, you know, you can't have uh, he public hearings unless someone requests it. You can't require them. So they've been slowly moving to become um, more liberal and easier for, for in-home. Um, my understanding is this new law that's passed really targets the in-home. Um, daycares and not so much the commercial. So the limitations on where they can be located for commercial sites are really a function of, of our municipal code. Of our municipal code. Right. And so the reason that we don't allow daycare centers mostly on the east side is because of contaminants, air quality, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. So um, in both, both in terms of uh, the Air District's recommendations and in terms of CEQA review when it is required, that's something that, that you know, we would look at. Um, if, a, if a daycare center were located in that area and an industrial use came into an area where they're permitted, we would then also have to look at this industrial use's impact on the, the sensitive receptor that's now located there as well. So, so it's not just a matter of, okay, we'll clean up the site and we'll because somebody wants to put a daycare center there. Right. And it, um, you know, we don't know what the what comes down the road, down the line, some other use that's permitted and they want to come in there and that could be a, could be a uh, an, an endangerment to the right. health and welfare of, of the children. And at the very least, studies would have to be done to show what right. re, what's there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like that's the more difficult lift mm -hmm. is locating them in, on the east side. So. We've talked a lot about fees and how much it costs. I was shocked, $43,000 per child to build. I, I can't even get my head around that. Um, so I was, and I'm wondering if maybe it's just almost a moot point because it's so high, but I'm wondering if we, if, let's say we just eliminated all the fees for daycare centers tomorrow. What sort of impact would that have given all the other constraints and pro prohibitions that we have currently? And it, it's really an opinion. I, I realize that. I'm just, I'm just kind of curious. I mean, how big of a hurdle is it? Is it, or is it not just the fees? I think one of the biggest, you know, one of the bigger impacts is also location and finding, you know, affordable rents mm -hmm. in con in conjunction with the labor costs um, that they have to provide. Okay. All right. And then my last question is uh, with this SB 234 coming into effect. Um, what, what sort of an impact do you see that having? Because it, it seems it's targeted primarily at residential mm -hmm. daycare. Um, it could have, so we have had uh, uh, daycare providers that have had to go to minor use permit hearings and um, they've, they've ended up being quite contentious because of neighbor concerns. So in that way, it, it'll be easier for the providers. Um, one aspect that we're not sure of is, you know, how much do these providers or possible, pro, you know, potential providers know about the process and actually being able to do it? So that's why we wanted to include outreach as part of that. Um, other than that, um, it would just be easier for them to to increase their amount of, of capacity and also maybe get started without having these fees up front. Thank you. Thanks. One of the great things about asking the questions last is you get to come up with more questions based on the questions that people had. So I have a lot, I apologize in advance. Um, and these are not in a particular order. <clears throat> so, um, and in fact, before I get into the questions, I'll just share my instinct 
looking at the numbers in sort of to add on to the discussion you and Ron were having about how big of an impact can reduction of our fees have on the economics of this business? My sense is it's probably fairly minor. And, and that doesn't mean, by the way, that I don't think we shouldn't do it, shouldn't think about waiving them. I'm just saying that, that if I were, was a childcare provider and the city asked me, you know, what could you do? I would respond by, well, you could eliminate the fees you charge me, you know, even if those are not the material thing that's gonna prevent you from, from a no, go or no go decision. Um, have we had um, discussions about potential partnerships uh, in in establishing additional child care capacity with the county? So with the county, we haven't had an, kind of an official partnership discussion. This is really intended to be kind of the kickoff conversation sure. to, yeah, so we've we've met with build up and that's kind of the extent of, of our outreach to the county. Um, but, you know, we did we did meet with the school district with uh, Superintendent Harmeyer and, you know, they, they shared that they're, they're beginning a facilities master plan effort and I saw some opportunity there to dovetail with our efforts. And so I think that there is enough need across all agencies to find places to collaborate and where we could have a mutually beneficial arrangement with both the county and school district and other agencies. Um, and, and by the way, that my, the fact that we haven't had discussions, I'm certainly not critical of that because we have to start someplace. It's just the reason I asked is because my understanding and sense is the county itself as an agency actually has a significant uh, child care problem for its own employees because it's a very large employee base that they would like to live in San Mateo County for a whole bunch of different reasons. And uh, that's a difficult thing to do without child care. So, you know, they, they may plus their financial resources are, you know, an order of magnitude greater than ours. So um, there may be an opportunity there to have some good discussions. Um, uh, again, these questions are, are, are in random order. Um, do we have the ability either from a zoning point of view or any other constraint to potentially expand, um, I'm gonna describe it as expand what I think of as the youth center complex. I and mean, we have a complex there that's youth center. It's designed to support young people. Um, it, it isn't in that sense, in my mind, that much of a stretch to somehow adding capacity onto it so that it also has a daycare facility in it. Have, have we looked at things like that or are there things that you're like, nice idea, but that can't work for the following two reasons? I don't see why that wouldn't be able to work. I think that we may not currently allow daycare as a, whether it would be a privately operated daycare on Parks land. I don't think it's currently zoned for that. But again, that could be part of the exploration of seeing districts that don't currently allow it. Maybe Parks as a district would be one that we do allow. Right. And whether it be a city, some cities, for example, the city of Santa Monica do fund their own facilities and then it's a city run facility for daycare. Um, and that's kind of one you know, one extreme version of, of, a, of a city program. Um, but, you know, there's also a scenario where a city could partner with a private partner who, you know, could be a public-private opportunity where you lease private land, uh, uh, public land for a private operator to come in. Yeah, because we've, I think when we've talked about this briefly before, um, I think like, for example, the Loreola Park, and the Loreola building situation came up. I mean, uh, at the 50,000 foot level, conceptually, doing something to leverage park space on a Monday to Friday work day environment. Actually, I, I don't want to imply that the parks are unused, you know, during those time periods, but they're nowhere near as heavily used as they are in the evenings or on, on the weekends. And so actually there's, there might be a nice sort of fit there, okay? Uh, if we could find out a way, find a way to do it. Obviously there'd be lots of negatives associated with that too, we'd have to work through, but that's something to think about. Um, are our, uh, zoning constraints in terms of uh, uh, sensitive receptor type things that we were talking about, are they um, more restrictive than the state standards as, as assuming the state has defined such for childcare facilities? So they're really guided by uh, the air, the air uh, quality board. Uh, you are a, there are no state standards in terms of a specific distance um, other than in CEQA. They talk about are there sensitive receptors and then, you know, studies that follow, what impacts are there, what are the mitigation measures. Um, there are definitely examples of cities that have had childcare in industrial areas. Um, 
I was talking to Kristen and she mentioned uh, Genentech and, and the new Stanford site. Um, so it really depends on, you know, what are we looking at? Are there gonna be studies involved? Um, there's not a, you know, this is the threshold. If you're below it, you can go if, if you're above it. You can't, so there's no you know number like that. Um, the Air Quality Board has specific standards for the types of industrial uses and particulates, um, and I won't go through this, but just to show kind of the breadth of what they're looking at. So each of these uses has sort of different levels and, and how far away they should be, um, but of course every site needs to be tested. So. Uh, and just as an observation, then I appreciate your mentioning the state itself does not have standards. But more generally, my question would be, um, you know, it, it, do we have, do we use standards of our own that are tighter than typical? And, and if so, I'd like to understand why, but it sort of sounds like we're following what's being handed down by the Bay, the Bay Area Quality Management District. Yeah, and I think 600 feet's kind of been the average um, across jurisdictions, sort of as like a you know best practice um, in terms of that. Um, but even the Air District's plan says, you know, this is our advice, but you need to study each site and and you know weigh the weigh the pros and cons of that. Um, this next question actually unusually so dovetails with this, this last one. The discussion you and Ron were having about citing things and having to be concerned about putting them in a, an area that otherwise is zoned for industrial use if an industrial use were to show up. Um, hypothetically, do we have the statutory authority to sort of turn that on its head? And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, this part of San Carlos is zoned for industrial use. However, if there is a daycare center that was opened up, you know, in this area, it is no longer allowed to, to do, that, you know, in other words, that we we constrain what industrial use can come in because there's a daycare center there. Or, or do we have the authority to have zoning rules like that, or is that considered spot zoning of some kind? Or maybe that's a great question. Well, what occurs to me is we, we have that situation with other ordinances in the city, like for cannabis and, um, and Mm -hmm. other uses like that. Um, we have to take those on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but it, I, I can't think of a reason why you couldn't have a, a rule that would, um, would provide that you couldn't um, introduce a use that was in, incompatible with, with an existing use, uh, except the, the devils and the details of creating the rules that would enable us to make the findings and 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 then there's also an overlay of policy issues that the council would want to grapple with on, on what that could possibly mean for, for the uh, industrial area. That's why we have highly trained staff available. <laughs> um, I, I, and it, it, this was just something I thought of as we were talking about it because it, it is a way potentially of expanding where things could go at the price of losing other things that might come in in the future and that's a balancing act that, that the council would have to discuss. Um, the uh, there's, there was a lot of attention focused, uh, rightfully so, on the operating costs and the wage versus uh, cost of living issue. Um, and that sparked a question, and this may be a Martin question. Um, do we have the statutory authority, if we chose to do so, to make uh, being a child care facility worker a, um, uh, uh, what's it called, like something that puts you further up on the list for affordable housing? In other words, I, I know there's been discussion about about um, granting teachers and public safety workers and whatnot, but do we have the authority to do something like that? So the council adopted a resolution maybe a couple of years ago that provide that that essentially sets up a priority for those who currently live or work in the city. So you you you're giving a preference to those two segments. Is the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yes. And so um, similarly, an, a new resolution could be adopted to give another preference to a, a particular segment of the population. Got it. And again, there are trade-offs and all this stuff as to whether we actually wanted to do something like that. Um, the uh, uh, I think in a discussion, uh, Andrea, that you were having having with Laura, you talked about how the one of the pending state law changes was that it was going to eliminate the requirement for community meetings for large scale. Um, would we still be able to sort of encourage 
providers to have voluntary meetings just because otherwise I can see, you know, huge neighborhood uproar, which doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, yes, we definitely could. We do that with, um, for example, our, our development um, applications too, where we really encourage um, them to, to reach out to the neighbors ahead of time and try to address any concerns um, beforehand. And that can be incorporated into outreach we do as well, especially okay. if we're not reviewing the application itself. Um, Next question, uh, I noticed in the written report, but I didn't see it in the oral report tonight, so I just wanna make sure that it hasn't like evolved or we discovered that something was, it, you know, it needed to be changed. Um, there was reference in the written report to it looked like South San Francisco actually has invested in or operates uh, child care facilities. Um, if, let's see, I, I had, let's see if I still have the page up here. The statement was, South San Francisco, this city has a strong child care program housed in the Parks Division. The program includes three preschools for children two and a half to five years. And I may have incorrectly assumed that that meant those were city operated. Yes. They are, okay. Um, it is, I didn't see that mentioned as a possibility here. Is, was there, and if so, was there a reason staff didn't suggest that? I think in terms of, um, we kind of just wanted to show sort of the, the breadth of what cities are doing. I don't know that there's a reason we didn't encourage it specifically, um, but yeah, we just want to show the, the range. Okay. Um, next question is kind of an extension of the state override for or preemption for allowing small and larger size uh, child care facilities. Um, is staff familiar with communities, I don't even know how this would work, but where, where a community might by zone, its zoning rules allow a, I guess the state has taken over the small and large, I'll say somewhat larger. In other words, allow something larger than what the state has preempted childcare facilities to operate in residential areas. In terms of commercial or, or the in-home? I, um, well, let me stop, and I, I've, I'm always a little bit confused by that because I presume the in-home ones, I mean, they're commercial businesses, right? So um, I'm not sure what the differentiation is. So uh, the in-home is like if, if I were to open a daycare at the house I live in and provide care for four children. So it's a resident operated. Resident, resident operated, operated, yes. And yeah, in I fact, guess, that's a requirement by the state. I, I guess I was thinking either resident operated somewhat larger or even commercially operated somewhat larger, not, not necessarily really big, but larger. Do we know of any communities that allow that kind of thing in their residentially zoned areas? I don't, um, but what I can say is that the state regulates the size, um, especially with the home. There's the definition of small and large is based on a number. Um, and then both uh, in home and commercial are further regulated by those limits on number of children you can have based on your number of employees. Right. So that's sort of the limiting factor um, as see, well. Put, put it another way, what I'm sort of teasing up here, and it's just something to think about, I'm not proposing we, we spend a lot of you know, effort on it, is, is whether we would allow a particular kind of business to operate in a residential area, a, a very specific one that exists solely to sort of serve the needs of the residents in the area that otherwise don't have childcare. Yeah, I mean, um, that's something we could definitely look at um, for your direction as but part it's, of the zoning. It's probably a fairly big deal because that's a, a land use, significant land use change. Um, let's see. I think these were most, the rest of these are most, oh, yeah, I have another question. Most of my other comment were things for discussion later. The uh, development impact fees, um, are those um, 218 fees? In, in other words, that they are subject to review by um, uh, local property owners or are they something that we just have the ability to impose? I believe that the development impact fee program is under the mitigation fee act, so it would be something you'd, you would be able to impose at the council level without. Okay. Um, and I think that's it in terms of questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, everybody, did anybody else have any questions from the dais before we turn over to the discussion phase? Ron? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I was curious, what do you mean when you say property tax set aside? So, um, I'm gonna introduce Ashley from EPS, which is our economics consultant. 
Hi, Ashley. good evening. Hi, Ashley Cannett with Economic and Planning Systems. The idea with the property tax set aside is that a portion of the property tax that comes to your general fund each year, you could allocate a percentage or you could allocate some percentage of that to childcare specifically. So, we could. so it would be uh, it would be taking some of your general fund revenue each year and setting it aside for childcare. So it's a carve out and not correct an additional fee. Unlike a sales tax or a new tax that would be subject to voter approval, that would be net new. Um, the property tax would be an allocation of existing. Does anybody do that? Um, we did. Where was that? San Francisco does that. Where? San Francisco. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just had a question about um, city operated preschools. We used to operate a preschool, right? At Loriola Park, we used to offer that kind of a service. Can you explain a little bit why the city got out of that business? Good evening, Amy. Good evening, Amy Newby, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, we eliminated that program just over a year ago. It was a part-time program. It wasn't serving the need of the community and the residents. It was um, a program on Monday and Wednesday, Tuesday and Thursday, and then we had a Friday um, like fine arts class. So it wasn't meeting this full-time childcare need in the community. We saw declining enrollment and the turnover rate for staff was ongoing. We could never get staff to commit um, just due to the cost of living. Thanks, Amy. Adam. Sorry, one last question. Um, can you just clarify, and maybe I may have missed this if you said it earlier, on the uh, sensitive receptor and the land use area, is that only applied to the commercial centers or is that applied, is that something that does apply to the in-home or is, there, or is that something the state manages? I'm just wondering, like, I know there's some potentially some places next to industrial uh, that are in-home, and how would that be affected? So um, sensitive receptors refer to any population that, that could be more vulnerable to, to pollution, so it does include residential areas. Um, I focus this evening on the daycare uses, um, but hospitals, um, schools, all of those are considered sensitive respect, uh, receptors. So if an industrial use were to come in um, with any of those as part of the environmental review, we'd be looking at what the impact of that new industrial use is on what's existing there now. But, and I'm, maybe I have this a misunderstanding. So, so if you're having a daycare center on the east side mm -hmm. somewhere, could you not be potentially, and it's an in-home facility, does that get affected by this sensitive, by CEQA on this, or are they exempt from that because they're part of this, there's an override on state law? Uh, so there's no override. It's, it's, in, it's an allowed use within the house that doesn't require any sort of um, discretionary permit, so CEQA doesn't apply. So you could have an in-home facility that is next to an industrial site that is polluted or contaminated? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sarah. One last question, and it's um, similar to Adam's question. How did we get around the sensitive uh, receptors issue when PAMF went in on the, on the east side? Really good air filters. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, there was a significant environmental cleanup at that site. So it was, uh, it was a contaminated site, and they cleaned it up to the states and the uh, um, um, the local environment, the health department's uh, requirements, so it's a clean site now. And it's a very large piece of land, too. So that's how they did it. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, let's, not that we can't ask additional questions as they come up, but let's uh, sort of shift gears a little bit and uh, move into a discussion and providing staff guidance phase because uh, the purpose of the study session, of course, is to give staff some feedback so that they can bring uh, uh, more detailed, more specific proposals back to the council for action in the future, for discussion and action in the future. Um, so um, uh, I'm not, you know, feel, people should feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll just sort of tee things off by saying personally, 
uh, this is a significant enough issue and I'm not sure that any one of the things that we've, that was teed up tonight as good as ideas as they were um, are going to be the solution. I, I personally wouldn't mind doing many if not all of these just to see what happens um, because I presume we can always dial things back if we have to or eliminate things that don't seem to be working. But that's just sort of an initial perspective. So. Um, I'm gonna make this kind of, if we wouldn't mind trying once again, an open mic thing rather than go through lights. So um, not that there's anything wrong with you guys turning your lights on, but, and in fact, we'll let Laura go first because she was the last one to turn her light off. <laughs> so thank you. I think, um, so after hearing the discussion and the inputs and an excellent presentation, by the way, thank you for, I agree, it's a very complex issue, but I think staff did a fantastic job of clarifying and framing the issue and then forwarding some uh, efforts that can be done to clear the path for increased capacity of daycare. Um, my concern overall is just that um, if we just pick the stars, <laughs> right, I don't think that that's gonna get us the capacity that we need. And in light of the fact that our community is growing, we know that it's expanding, the population along the peninsula is increasing. Uh, I think it's really important um, that we look at some of the longer term or midterm solutions as well. Uh, the whole discussion, I think, around zoning is really curious to me. Um, and as I'm thinking about the idea about putting a linkage fee or requiring some of the larger developments to include daycare, right, those are gonna be right in those zones for which it's not permitted. So I feel like we're gonna have to wrestle with this. So I would like us to, you know, capture the low-hanging fruit. I'm in alignment with all the stars here, um, but I also think we need to push it a bit further. Uh, to try to figure out really how we're gonna increase capacity in a meaningful way uh, so that it grows with our community. Uh, it, it, uh, I, I think I agree with all that. Um, just any particular thoughts on some of the uh, uh, medium term or longer term things you think we ought to be directing staff to work on? Well, so the medium term, um, just looking at the zone area here that we have, for example, you have highlighted uh, earlier for us Martin, the mixed use downtown core where it's prohibited, right? And I'm envisioning a community where we have a lot of multifamily housing where, for example, you know, people could walk their kids downtown, for example. The church that was mentioned earlier um, by Robert Stafford, I um, can't remember the name of it at the moment, but I do know that there was a person that was interested in opening a child care facility there, and I don't know whatever came of that particular discussion. Um, there's one right next door to it. So, you know, you know, let's, kind of break the mold a little bit and what we have in place and try to be creative about this um, because uh, it's quite expensive. For example, at work today, there were folks that have, you know, it was Columbus Day, so schools were closed and a lot of folks brought their kids to, to work because they have nowhere to take them. So it's, it spills over everywhere. And it was stressful for the, for the staff. Thank you for, thank you, Chair. Um, so I think for me, uh, um, I, I'd love to look at this kind of, I, I think there's sort of multiple, it's sort of a holistic view of it. You've got the overall cost uh, to open, you've got the cost of labor, um, and I also think there's this view of how do we, how do we make it maybe childcare more affordable for some people as well. Um, I think that's something that hasn't been touched on that I'm interested in. I mean, we just waived the one fee on the traffic impact fee, and if we're looking to waive other fees, I, to me, I think if we're giving a benefit, um, we should be getting a benefit back for the community, and I think there should be looking at maybe pr that they, the childcare facilities can be over time providing spaces for low-income families. Uh, we talked about, uh, the chair talked about sort of affordable housing for the um, employees, but I think there's ways we can do things to back to the, give back to the community as well. Um, because I do think some of these, uh, I mean, there are some large commercial centers that are, you know, large national internet, you know, sort of multi-state large facilities that I'm sure that the, the fees themselves are not that impactful for them and I'd like to see how we kind of work with them if we're gonna do any sort of reduction or, or waiver of fees that we get something back for the community for um, for our residents. And then I think looking at, to me the, you know, I'm interested in a lot of these other starred areas. I'm interested in the zoning districts on a long-term standpoint as well. Um, I'm be curious to see how we, can look at dealing with sort of the wage levels as well. Um, we're gonna discuss minimum wage for the, in the city coming up soon. Is that something we'd wanna look at for childcare workers um, 
as a potential. So I think I'd love to sort of be creative about some of this as well uh, in terms of providing some of the, the benefits, but um, you know, looking at increasing space as best we can. And I think we should look at the school district potentially to, instead of maybe us operating something, maybe the school district already has an infrastructure in place, and maybe if there was a partnership, that might be a way to expand at some of the parks and other facilities as well, instead of having to recreate an infrastructure for ourselves. Um, may, may I dovetail, actually ask a clarifying question and dovetail on that. Um, th your first comment, I wanna make sure I understood, Adam, that, that if I understood you, you were sort of saying to the extent, to the extent we are providing benefits by cutting fees or what have you for, to encourage childcare facilities to operate or open within San Carlos, that we ought to be also simultaneously asking them or requiring them to set aside a certain number of, of spaces for lower income people. I just wanna make sure I understood. I think that that's right. And it doesn't have to happen like we, we need to get a one for one benefit, but I, I'd like to see some benefit back to the community for if we're, we're for people are struggling with the cost of daycare, then that would be one way to help out um, on that. And I, I just to dovetail on that, I, I forgot to mention on the, the development fee or the, the fund we talked about, I guess I'd not, would not like to limit it to facilities. So I'd like to look at some of the operational pieces because maybe it's, it is a way that we can get, make childcare more affordable. Maybe it's a piece for that. There are other things to just think about. Uh, and I don't know specifically what that might be, but a sort of affordable childcare might be one aspect that we could use with those fees. Fair enough, and by the way, the reason I was asking you to clarify that was because I, I wanted to understand it. I actually support it. I don't know if other people do, but I support that idea. There ought to be a, uh, this is an overused phrase in the current American political dialect, but you know, a quid pro quo. <laughs> um, um, uh, Ron, I think you had some stuff you wanted to. Yeah, I, 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 I like all the options. I, I just consider them <clears throat> sort of low hanging fruit. Uh, those are the things, they're, they're all, Reason I don't want to say easy lifts, but they're things that that can be done. Uh, but I also think that sort of going back to or along the lines of what Laura was talking about, we need to develop a long-term strategy, and I'm not sure we need to do it by ourselves. Um, I'm you know we have this Home for All initiative in San Mateo County where we bring people in from every city, and we're working on all uh, on building more housing. Um, this isn't just a San Carlos problem. This is a countywide problem. And I'm thinking that maybe we ought to figure out a way to bring uh, representatives from other cities together and really work on this because this is this problem isn't going away and it's and, and it's getting increasingly difficult for people not only to move here but to raise a family here. I mean, this is a huge part of it, and so I don't think that we should do you know uh, all the thinking in a vacuum. I think we I think we really need to develop a strategy where we're engaging our neighboring cities or, or other cities in the county and work on a strategy, a long-term strategy that where we're gonna significantly increase the uh, uh, child care opportunities. Um, the, uh, thank you. Um, one other thing I wanted to, Adam, to follow up on something you mentioned, you talked about partnering with the school district um, since they operate a lot of these facilities already. Uh, I actually, want to support that very strongly. I think if the school district is willing, and I would love to see discussions with them, uh, they not only have experience operating things here, they're also a place that people go to drop off kids already anyway. And um, I, I don't mean to sound callous about this, but they are relatively land rich and cash poor, whereas we are sort of in the opposite position right now. So to the extent that there, there may be some natural synergies that can take place there, uh, uh, sites on various campuses they have that could be turned into uh, child care facilities or have them added or expanded or, or, or whatnot. Um, and I'd also like to see if, uh, I mentioned this in the Q&A session, see if uh, my colleagues have any interest, not in committing to do this, but to have staff study whether or not the city itself could look at developing partnerships with a private provider that were based on um, parkland. Uh, or I don't want to. I don't want to 
reduce the size of our parks because they're sort of barely big enough to begin with, but there may be locations and places where my sense is child care facility, child care facilities, you're not generally building a facility for 300 children. You're building it for a smaller group of children and you're building a number of them in various places. And to the extent that those could fit in a park, they, they have access then to some of the recreational area that we want the kids to have. So I don't know what, what people feel about that but I'd I wouldn't mind seeing staff study that kind of thing. I'm I'm thinking that that's that's an excellent topic to talk about when we have our uh, uh, mini retreat. And we can we, maybe we can get in a little bit more detail on it and then figure out exactly what we want to ask staff to do. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't object to that. But I I, I think it's I think it's uh, be a reasonably clear thing to ask staff to look at to to begin with whether it's even possible or feasible and what the implications are. Um, and I admit, Ron, that part of the reason I'm saying that is because I always have sort of a bias for action if we can do it. I, I understand. Yeah. I, and I'd, I'd, I'd be okay with that, Chair, just to kind of look at, I mean, I think if we're just looking at it, not committing to anything on it, it'd be, and I, I would want to clarify, I think my thought was on the school district piece was if we looked at some areas that the city wanted to sort of lease out, instead of using a private provider, maybe partnering with the school district on that. Sure, yeah. As an option. Yeah. Uh, just because they're already doing it, and if they op could operate in a different facility, that they may have the infrastructure already in place. And, and you know, I, I said partnering just because other than South San Francisco, it, did, it doesn't sound like too many cities actually are in the childcare business currently. I mean, that's a significant commitment on our part. And so, you know, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it or consider it, but I, it's a bigger deal. I, I'm just a little bit concerned about, you know, the workload. Um, I mean, one thing that jumps out at me is that we, we don't even have a city a policy objective on this and that we ought to start talking about that that ought to be something not only for the mini retreat but the str uh, strategic planning meeting uh, coming up next year I mean that's something this is this is an important issue um, but we have a lot of other things we're working on I want to make sure that we give it the proper attention and and put it in our in our uh, in our vision our city vision I I, I I understand and respect the point of view. I don't, as I said, necessarily agree with it, but but that's, um, it'll, you know, as the discussion evolves on the dais, we can see uh, what people think about that in terms of the issue of whether we direct staff to start working on that kind of thing, studying it now, or, or whether we do the mini retreat discussion first. Um, I have a couple Sarah, thoughts. Yes, I, I was going to say, I haven't Thank heard you, from Mark. you yet. Which, <laughs> and since this was your idea originally, I figured you probably had something you wanted to say. Uh, this has been a very robust discussion. I've appreciated everyone's thoughts. I want to also thank staff for bringing this back. That was a wonderful presentation, um, and it was very thoughtful, and it's given us a lot to think about. And I have to admit, this whole conversation is kind of giving me my anxiety all over again because I remember very clearly being a mom on maternity leave and holding an eight-week-old baby and um, still being on five different wait lists. And um, that's an incredible strain on a family. And I can guarantee you that there are several parents here in San Carlos going to bed tonight feeling the exact same way. So um, I'm really grateful that we're discussing this tonight. It's a really important topic to tackle. Um, we're seeing more and more two-income parents here in our city and in our county. And I went back to a survey that was presented to us back in April that showed that just 4.5% of our population are homemakers, which is kind of an antiquated term, but I think that means stay-at-home parent, um, which is a very small and ever-decreasing percentage. Um, I also want to recognize that this issue was discussed in October of 2017, which was exactly two years ago. And I'm not really sure what we tackled in those two years, but Suffice to say that I don't want to wait another two years to get some action on this issue and make some progress. And um, over the last few days, I just wanted to share with my colleagues that I did spend some time speaking with a family daycare operator here in San Carlos, as well as a child care center operator. And I wanted to share with you what I heard, which was the cost of land is prohibitive. It's hard to find appropriate space. Navigating the city's process is not clear for the operators, and the wait lists are overflowing, especially for infants. Um, I think Adam alluded to this, that 
you know, the school district has opened up several preschools and I think that's alleviated a little bit of the supply and demand, but that's for preschoolers. That's for the three to five year olds and the zero to three year olds are still a great demand. So, um, oh, and one other thing I heard from the operators was affordable housing. I just wanna throw that in too um, for their employees. So um, I think, you know, we've all discussed looking at the start issues and I think those are great places to start. Um, I would like to look into opening up or looking at zoning um, as was alluded to by my colleagues to find more space. Um, I'd like to um, consider establishing a childcare startup guide, um, which I think BuildUp has worked on before. And I think that we do really need to put some resources out there to help operators through the process because it sounds like it is daunting right now and difficult um, to just kind of figure out how to get through the process. I like the idea of partnering with um, different um, cities or county organizations or build up to really leverage their knowledge that they have from already working on this with other cities. I'm, opening, I'm open to waiving fees. Um, I do like the idea, especially if, you know, um, working on zoning on the east side sounds um, difficult, although I liked your idea, Mark, about, um, you know, trying to find ways to work on that. But I think that we, I would like to study a linkage fee and really understand what other cities are, are doing with that money, whether that's, loans or grants to really help um, those looking to open childcare facilities here. Um, I think that being known as a city with restrictive policies on childcare is not really the reputation that I want for San Carlos. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm open to, to working on this um, as soon as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, uh, while I was listening to you, one, one thought that something you said, I don't remember exactly what it was, reminded me of. Um, when we've talked about some of the challenges from a, a contaminated ground point of view on the east side, uh, that's actually an issue that has surfaced multiple times since I've been on the council. Uh, and it's, it's definitely a community issue. And, and you know, these are problems that were caused by polluters years ago who, uh, technically under the law can still be held accountable for what they've done even many, many years later. The problem and the, the, the problem in that, in trying to perfect that is uh, proving it and actually attaching the liability because as you might imagine, they tend to fight hard to find ways to avoid that. Um, one thought that I had is, um, uh, you know, there is an argument to be made that if the city were to invest some of its, its financial capability, either surpluses or, or money that it borrowed, um, to clean up land on the east side so that it could be used for childcare facilities, um, that's, um, in a way, that's sort of a, 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 a double bang win. I mean, we're cleaning up the environment, which is a good thing, even if we'd like the people who caused the problem to pay for it. Um, we're avoiding expensive lawsuits and we're enabling more childcare capacity to be built. So um, uh, that was just sparked by something you said, Sarah. I'm not sure how hard I want to push it, but I want, do want to tee it up to keep it in people's minds that you know those are things that we can do. It's not, it, it, we don't have to look for a private sector company to come in and clean up land and then build something on it like PAMF did. Uh, we, we could choose to do that ourselves if we wanted to and if we thought the community benefit was great enough. Uh, and it might be given that, you know, if it was tied to childcare capacity. Um, Jeff, uh, uh, on behalf of staff, um, do you have information that you can use to go into the next step of this, or do we need to uh, fine tune some things? Uh, um, give us some guidance. Uh, I think this has been a great conversation with a lot of very specific uh, direction and uh, thoughts and feedback from the council. I suspect there's probably going to be a couple of areas where we'll want to circle back around. But in the meantime, I think there's a lot for us to really get to work on, um, as well as I'm sure some thoughts that have been generated by the staff on sort of additional approaches to some of the policy and um, 
practical uh, considerations that the council's shared with us tonight. Um, I, I think in terms of the list, really the only thing that really hasn't gotten any discussion on the council would be about a tax measure. Um, I don't recall anybody having said anything about that one way or another, but I think on everything else on the list, we've gotten some pretty specific feedback. If I'm reading his body language correctly, I think Adam may be about to correct that. Yes. All right, I was gonna add that, that I, I am not interested in that option. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that is a correction. Yeah, and just real quick, um, given uh, the fact that SB 234 is coming out in January, and I know the staff does a really great job with communication to the broader community, I would love to see some content that's proactive and shared broadly, um, as, along with any of the changes that come out of, you know, as a result of this conversation uh, to demonstrate and educate that we're making it easier for people to open up daycare. Can I just add on that, on the, just on the fee um, reduction or waiver, I'm, I, I'm supportive of that only if we're getting something back. I'm not necessarily supportive of that if we're just gonna waive fees for the purpose of weighing fees, waiving fees. Um, so I'd like to get some community benefit out of that if we're gonna do that. Um, I, I'll reiterate, I think I said before when I asked you to clarify it, I, I support that as well. Mm -hmm. It's, I think I heard somebody say mm -hmm, yeah. on my left. Well, my, I mean, my understanding this is a study session. These are general ideas, right? And then yeah. the, you know, the specifics will come back to council for us to debate the merits of, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, any final comments anybody would like to make? Good discussion. All right. Um, we will move on to uh, item 10A, consideration of introducing. Thank you, everybody. By the way. Uh, consideration of inducing, introducing an ordinance to amend and modify San Carlos Municipal Code Chapter 15.04, Technical Building Codes, to adopt the 2019 California Building Code Series, and introduce an ordinance adopting the 2018 edition of the International Fire Code with the 2019 California Fire Code amendments. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, Chair Olbert, members of council. Um, God, you convinced everybody almost to leave. That's, that's, that's impressive. Okay. That's a great power. <laughs> that's all right. Um, uh, good evening again. Um, the, as you stated, we're introducing the 2019 uh, fire, uh, California Fire Code and Building Code uh, series. This is a 50,000 foot view. It's not, because it doesn't get into specifics of um, all the code enhancements. It does touch upon some of the, you know, perhaps the primary um, uh, elements. Um, Chris Valley building official uh, behind me is Gareth uh, Harris, our fire marshal, uh, to address any questions or comments you may have. <clears throat> Moving along. Uh, the California building codes are uh, updated every three years <clears throat> with uh, mid-cycle adjustments and they become effective January 1st, 2020. The San Carlos amendments are historically minimal. Uh, they align with neighboring cities, state goals, and uh, in this round, uh, consider future all electric infrastructure. Uh, as a code official, uh, we strive for consistency amongst uh, different agencies, um, architects, engineers, <clears throat> and uh, contractors appreciate the same. Our code adoption uh, is typically, uh, it, it reflects, a, historically reflects a practical enforcement of the building and fire code uh, that does not impose unreasonable financial hardship uh, to property owners, contractors, and developers. And we're essentially just codifying, um, you know, uh, elements that we've uh, required in past development and so forth. Um, this is a, an important element of the code adoption process is that it's, uh, it's it's extremely collaborative at the state level. It uh, involves multi-state agency stakeholder input and uh, with uh, architects, engineers, building officials, and in, uh, industry manufacturers such as window and door manufacturers, HVAC, and so forth. And as I stated previously, local agencies can amend the codes as they see fit. Um, some of the more notable changes for residential is we now have mandatory solar. Um, the energy code with mandatory solar is for a single family residence would uh, Im 
improve uh, prior efficiency by upwards of 53%. Uh, kitchen range hoods require a third-party home energy rating system inspector, that's otherwise known as HERS. Uh, what that means is the, the hood system needs to be pressure tested now, uh, similar to uh, furnace ducts that uh, came about in the last code cycle. Um, Improved window and door performance is, is evident in the code, as well as uh, air quality improvements and insulation uh, improvements as well. A few more residential improvements or enhancements. Uh, electrical panels shall be prepped and properly sized for future all electric appliances. Uh, and I'll tap into that a little further later on in another slide. Um, uh, further enhancements for insulation, uh, another third-party inspection requirement for uh, insulation, uh, otherwise known as QII, quality insulation inspection. And so it, it, you st we're starting to see a lot more of the, of the third-party uh, element, uh, inspection element with the, the built environment. Uh, demand response controls for HVAC in layperson's terms, that's a utility provider having control over your HVAC system, and pilot lights are prohibited. Uh, for commercial, some of the more notable changes, uh, the energy code is 30% more stringent than uh, the last code cycle. Uh, again, more demand response controls for uh, mechanical and lighting systems. Uh, commercial spaces have a... Um, solar ready requirement uh, for pathways and connectivity uh, for uh, future solar. Uh, equipment uh, e efficiency has increased, and again, pilot lights are prohibited. <laughs> um, anticipating all electric, uh, so the, um, the prior, uh, or the current version and prior version, I believe, of the uh, green building standards um, code uh, required that uh, residences be equipped with um, conduits for uh, future electric vehicle charging stations. They're not saying you have to drive an electric vehicle, they're saying you need to prep the residence for that charger in the future. Um, the, the new energy code requires that a newly built residence, uh, one and two story and so forth, I'm sorry, one and two family dwellings, townhouses and, and uh, residential reconstruction, be provided with a, a circuit from the main panel or sub-panel to the location of the uh, water heater area uh, for future all-electric. Um, the, the enhancement that we are um, suggesting here for our code, again, anticipating the all-electric uh, future that the, the state appears to be going down, is uh, new one and two family dwelling townhouses and residential reconstruction projects for each dwelling unit shall have an electric conduit to accommodate a dedicated branch circuit for the following uh, electrical appliance locations. And that's clothes dryer, uh, future uh, heat pump um, in place of uh, gas powered HVAC, and then kitchen cooking. Those are kind of the three primary uh, areas that uh, will be impacted um, with the future all electric um, path that the state appears to be taking. So what this does is it, is, is it preps you know, new projects that are being built such that eight to 10 years down the road, they're not tearing out walls to rewire a house or provide uh, circuits to these three areas. It's, it's basically prepped and ready to go. Um, future code changes and goals, just a couple more slides here. Uh, by 2022, that, that, that would be the next code cycle. Um, it is discussed or anticipated that multi-residential development will have its own code book dedicated to such projects. Um, through uh, SB 190, the state fire marshal has been provided direction to recommend wild urban interface construction method improvements. And this is a result, of course, of the fires that California has uh, had over the last couple of years. Moving forward, it's the, the state is not sitting on their hands whatsoever when it comes to code enhancements. Um, 
each uh, enhancement will be taken toward all electric at the state level and will include extensive stakeholder input. This will be um, not only at each uh, code cycle, every three year cycle, but there's also a, a mid cycle adjustment that is also uh, incurred to reach these goals. And um, through AB 3232, um, the uh, steps will be taken to reduce residential and commercial greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. If you'll recall AB 32, which came about, I believe, in 2006 or 2008, was the um, catalyst that created the California Green Building Standards Code. That, the goal of that bill was to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020, and that goal was achieved by 2016. So the, the state is, um, they're reaching their goals, and like I said, they're not um, sitting on their hands. Uh, but the future code will also, um, the future code enhancements, will start delving into existing buildings uh, to reach uh, these goals. And uh, there's a Senate bill, uh, 350, that I also need to discuss. Uh, that directs the California Energy Commission to reduce, um, or I should, I'm sorry, to uh, achieve a statewide accumulated um, doubling of energy efficiency by 2030 as well. Uh, so th these are, are big goals that the state has that will dovetail with the, you know, the building code adoption process at the state level and will incur a, an extensive amount of stakeholder input. And with that, if you have any questions, again, Gareth is right behind me, and if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you, Chris and Gareth. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, I suspect the answer to this next question is if anybody in the community would like to uh, comment on this item, please give Crystal a card. But seeing none, um, questions from the dais. Ron, I see your light was on. Thank you, Chair Obert. Uh, just a couple. Um, I didn't see anything in here about uh, battery storage. Uh, at, in recent, you know, in the recent weeks with PG&E shutting things down, I was listening to a uh, interview on uh, KQED, and they were talking about you know solar, and people are asking questions. Well, if you have solar, does that you know does that mean you don't have to use you know PG&E? And they explained that the uh, the energy just basically fed back into the grid, but if PG&E shuts off the power, you're not getting anything from your solar, and then that led to the discussion about having battery units. And I'm wondering, is the state talking about that? At, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the technology in batteries, in fact, I was just reading about it today, is advancing rapidly, and it right. would seem to me that somewhere as we evolve that we're gonna to get to the point where we're gonna want people, if, you, if you're gonna put in solar, if we're gonna require solar, right. You know, there ought to be a battery component to it. So that's my first question. Uh, okay. Where do you uh, see that? So we, uh, building code adoption aside, we, we are starting to see a lot more uh, PV slash battery combination permits, mm -hmm. per, uh, permit applications, primarily from Tesla. Um, they have somewhat of a um, corner in that market. Uh, currently, the, the, the building code is not, or I should say the energy code is, is not requiring battery or battery backup but it encourages it somewhat through um, the, uh, you're allowed a slightly lesser um, kilowatt amount of, your, of the required PV if you include a battery system with it. So there's somewhat of an, an incentive there, okay. but, but it's, uh, it, it, it's not yet uh, mandatory, but I, I foresee that coming down the road again with the, future enhancements of the code and the state's goals toward all electric. Okay. I think that's forthcoming, in other words. Yeah, I, that, that was my, my question is, 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 it, is. is it coming down the pike? It I is. mean, I hope so, because I, I would like so. to. I believe and, so, yes. Yeah, and that, that'll be a new construction, I, I would yes. hope. Yeah. Do you know whether or not there's gonna be any incentives for retrofitting existing residences for any of these energy saving measures? That currently, at least, uh, to my knowledge, is is an unknown. Um, uh, there, there may be um, that's going to be a large portion of the housing stock. Uh, we're, we're touching on a fair amount with the with the new um, uh, dwelling units that I mentioned. Right. Uh, but but that is a challenge for the for the all electric uh, forthcoming. So, uh, and that's kind of why there's there's a uh, some 
you know, uh, benefit to kind of a wait and see uh, to um, see where, how that is affecting um, existing homes and such. Okay, and uh, my, my only other question is on, I think it was slide eight, you talked about in, where it says anticipating all electric. This is some, you said this was a suggestion that you think, you feel we ought to put in our own I, I code, is that right? I have actually included that uh, as, as part of our ordinance and as part of the track changes in the uh, technical building codes, I've, I have included this language. Okay, and, and the That's reason why I mentioned it, is and that and the reason for that is that this is probably the state's probably going to mandate this at some exactly. point anyway. We're just getting out ahead yeah. of the game. So, some people might call this a reach code, but it's it's really a modification of our electrical code under uh, required branch circuits is to prep a new residence, i.e., one and two family dwellings, townhouses, and residential reconstruction projects for future all electric, uh, such that when the all electric does come. I, I've heard it's, it'll be within eight or 10 years that they're not having to rewire a, a brand new house for that all electric um, time. And you brought up breach codes. I, I'm sure that my, other, my colleagues on either side of me are probably gonna have some questions about Perhaps. that. So anyway, thank you, Chris. Sure. Adam. I have a question about reach codes. Okay. <laughs> um, I, and I guess I, I I get that's, from what Ron said. That's a colleague on the wrong side. No. <laughs> um, I, I think I understand from your discussion with Council Member Collins about this, but can you, so the, the, what we've heard from the last couple of meetings where people are coming and asking for reach codes, the difference is more of either mandating all electric construction or getting rid of gas or requiring certain energy efficiencies if you have gas. That's sort of what they're talking about, the reach codes, versus what you're saying is just to sort of have it prepped for it. Exactly. Okay. Yes. And that's, and that's, and so you're, it's sort of a incremental step towards it, anticipating what we're going to see potentially later on. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Great. And, and, and it, but it dovetails with the, what the state is, has done in the past and where we're going in the future. Got it. Great. Thank you. Right. Laura. Uh, thank you, Chair Elbert. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so, uh, pursuant to your additions that you're adding with respect to uh, preparing for electricity for clothes dryer, HVAC, kitchen cooking, was there a reason that you left out cars? I, it's already in the code. Oh, it's already in the code. Yes, it's okay. under the, and I'm sorry if I failed to mention that. It, it's, it's already under the uh, uh, green building, uh, Cal Green. It's, so, it, is that for residents as well as the commercial buildings and the multifamily? That also is in the code. Uh, okay. Requirement for um, electrical electric vehicle charging areas. Got it. Okay. And that uh, has become enhanced under the new code as well. Mm -hmm. the, the number of slots required. Got it. All right. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry if I didn't mention that. No, that's, that's okay. You may have mentioned it. I might, I might have missed it. Um, and then the other mention that you had was the fact that pilot lights are prohibited. So if help me understand just the technical aspects of this. If gas will still be allowed, if a, uh, some, a developer wants to put it in, it's, is, is it really the ignition switch yes. technology that you're saying has to be in place? Yes. Okay, yeah. all right. And then um, just building on the, the battery storage issue, um, the disposal of these batteries, as I'm understanding it, are also not, there's no regulations around how to dispose of them and they're fairly toxic, is that correct? I've heard I, that you're, we're stepping a little bit beyond my, my code knowledge here, but uh, okay. it's, that, so, yes, th th there is that discussion okay. of, so of, of what just, happens with the batteries. I think it's just something we need to look at. So when I spoke to a, a car repair shop in the area uh, about the possibility of getting an electric car, he shared with me that there's really no requirements for battery disposal hmm. uh, for some of these things, and they're, you know, they're Unwieldies. Oh, looks like somebody has a comment on this. So, oh, okay. Maybe. Mind if I just? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Marshall. Thanks. Uh, the reality is, is that the uh, the lithium batteries are already regulated, mm, uh, are considered a hazardous material. So got it. There is already state laws and regulations around the disposal of lithium batteries. So, I mean, even the lithium battery in your iPhone, you yes. can't just throw that in the trash. It is. Okay. Regulated. It's regulated waste and there's a whole process on how to dispose of it. So it's no different from your home battery storage system batteries or your Tesla batteries if they're replaced or anything like that. So that is already part of state law, state regulations. Thank you. I'll go back to that car shop owner and let them know that there's laws that they should be yeah, following. Which, which shop was that? I, I'm not <laughs> 
I'll, I'll never tell. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you, Mark. I just had a question about um, the slide, notable changes residential, and you mentioned uh, demand response controls for HVAC. Yes. I'm just curious, could you explain that a little bit more, please? Well, give me one second here. I was hoping someone would ask that. Um, an example of that would be, let's say, you know, all five council members are all running their AC unit on a hot summer day and the uh, utility issues, what's called a demand response event. Um, that event gets transmitted, I have notes here, so just please excuse me, uh, via power lines or radio signal to your residences. Uh, the HVAC controls then within your residences must be able to control the, must be able to increase or decrease, increase or decrease the cooling temps by four degrees. So one of the five of you will have a, perhaps have your uh, HVAC uh, adjusted to accommodate um, a, a, in overtaxing of the grid one way or another. That's, I'm trying to put this in layperson terms to best explain it with the knowledge that I have right now. <laughs> that is very interesting, it is. thank you. I, I, and, and, and it's interesting. <laughs> I don't like it. it, it yeah, it, like that, that's actually, yes, it's, um, it's, <laughs> And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in you know the, the real built environment, frankly. So, um, I had a few questions, but just following on that particular discussion, I have to say, if they actually have, if they're thinking about setting it so that you change the temperature by four up to four degrees, I can defeat that very easily. I'll just set my thermostat really low and and not have it turn on, and they're welcome to change it up by four degrees, and there we go. There's right? a loophole in every code, exactly. I think, yes. Um, you should perhaps suggest to them they hire some programmers to actually think about this stuff because it might might help they them. They may out. have considered it. Um, kind of on that on that same page, uh, and just out of curiosity, uh, I was curious if if there has been any discussion of moving to address a similar issue, the same issue in a different way, which is um, what are called presence detectors. Something I've been playing with on uh, on my home, although I haven't set it up yet. That basically. Um, you can actually get thermostats and whatnot that through your your cell phone, they sense whether or not you're home. And if you're home, they, you know, your normal cooling or heating system pro program is in effect. If you're gone, it switches to a different thing, which might be higher temperatures or lower temperatures, you know, depending on the season. Have, there, have you heard of any discussion about that, about maybe mandating that kind of thing? That's a good question. I mean, it's technology that people are using right now. Um, it, it, there are, um, I would have to research that question a little bit closer to, uh, that, to get the. I, I don't want to waste staff time on that. It was more just curiosity. I mean, if, if you hear about that, I'd just be curious to yeah, hear about it. Um, I'd have to research that. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't bother. More in depth. Um, is there a requirement or a pending requirement coming forward for commercial projects that they, they have solar? In other words, that a commercial project must have a sol some solar capacity built? Uh, yes, um, right. Maybe I missed that. Uh, solar ready space uh, for commercial with you know literal pathways on the roof. Sorry, what I meant is not just ready, but in other words, if you're gonna build a commercial building, you have to put you know 20 kilowatts of power on the, on the roof. Yeah, no, uh, solar is now at the, solar ready um, phase of the code adoption process. So the answer to your question is it will probably be mandatory okay. by possibly by the next code cycle. But, so, but not yet, it's, that's what right. the trend seems to be. Exactly, okay. so it's, it's, it's this incremental improvement of the code to adapt to these enhancements that are coming okay. down the road. Um, and then the issue about uh, on anticipating all electric where, where staff is suggesting that we go a little bit beyond what was given to us from, from the state. I'm still a little bit, I heard you and Ron talking about that, but I'm still a little bit confused. It, I understand, if I'm understanding it correctly, we, we want to get ready so that houses are, that are built today don't need to have walls torn out and be rewired exactly. in the future. I guess the question I have is, that almost implies that we're anticipating that five or 10 years down the road, the state's gonna say, that house you built 10 years ago, you gotta rip open the walls and do something. 
which that's not, not unheard of, but that's an unusual thing for the state to do. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that the, the all electric, you know, um, will be that draconian for existing residences or existing uh, residential structures. Um, I, I have heard though of the state delving into, um, you know, uh, existing commercial buildings for uh, energy improvements. Um, what, what I'm getting at is, is a, I'm, if it's if we're not anticipating that the state is going to require a house built in 2019 to be retrofitted, okay, then why are we why are we imposing an additional burden on the house being built in 2019 to meet something that's never going to happen or not expected to happen? Are you talking about all electric? Uh, I'm um, sorry. Uh, yes. I know that all electric is coming, but, but what I just heard you say, maybe I misheard you, is that when all electric comes, it's not likely to be retroactively applied to houses saying, hey, anything, you know, in 2025, the code gets changed, and they say anything built since 2019 had better be all electric. I, correct. So how, how, all right, I, now I know what you're asking. Um, I, I, the, the retroactive component of um, all electric it has yet to be determined. It's it that, that that's kind of an unknown of, of how that's going to come into play. But there might be one for for existing residences. Well, it, it, the workshop that I attended five month five weeks ago, the the instructor uh, Scott uh, Blunk is his name. Uh, he mentioned you know within ten years um, supposedly throwing a switch. You know whether or not a big gas switch gets shut off and and that's how this plays out. That's that, that's hard to say. But um, there, there, there's going to need to be uh, engagement, you know, with the state and with uh, uh, the, the the existing building component of all this is is um, is somewhat of an unknown, frankly, uh, for for residential. Um, I, I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself here, but uh, no, uh, it, it, we, it, it has yet to be seen how how that's going to play out. Uh, let, let me just for my own sake, if nobody else is, um, it sounds like what I'm hearing from you, Chris, is that it is in fact possible that the migration to all electric homes will have a retroactive component in it. Yes. Which, which typically, my understanding is, when the, typically when the state changes building codes, they rarely have retroactive components in them, where they say, go back and oh, tear correct. down yeah, something exactly. you did and yeah, no. do it differently. Yeah. But you're saying in this case, they might actually do that. It, it, it's, yes. Okay, but there is that if, possibility. If, if I can also add, there's another component to this in terms of the state's ability to regulate products. So let's imagine your gas stove stops working and needs to be replaced in seven years, but you can no longer buy one in California. So they haven't changed the building code on you, but you can't put in a gas stove and you need a stove. So they start, you know, there could be a confluence of different regulatory schemes that are designed to cause homeowners to change their habits and um, reinvest in the, their home infrastructure. And, and I, I appreciate that clarification and this discussion. It's just, the, the key thing to me is it sounds like your, your sense is some of these things, whether it's what you were talking about, about retroactivity or what Jeff is talking about, might actually apply here. In, in which case, it makes sense to do what you're talking about. I, I just, otherwise it's like, well, why don't we anticipate what the state's gonna do in some other area and just do that? So. I, I, thank you for that. I, uh, it, it, it more than likely will be for, for existing residences. You know, when, you, when it comes time to replace your furnace, okay, now you're all electric. And that's where the outreach to uh, uh, industry manufacturers is so critical for all of this. Okay, is. that's fair. No, I, I, I just wanted to clarify. Um, any other questions or comments, discussion? If not, I will entertain, thank you, Chris and Garth. I will entertain a motion. I move to introduce ordinance number? 1553. 1553, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending San Carlos Municipal Code Chapter 15.04, Technical Building Codes, to adopt the 2019 editions of the California Administrative Code, California Building Code Volumes 1 and 2, California Residential Code, California Electrical Code, California Mechanical Code, California Plumbing Code, California Energy Code, California History Historical Code, 
California Existing Building Code, California Green Building Standards Code, California Reference Standards Code, 1997 Uniform Security Code, the 2018 edition of the International Property Maintenance Code with amendments and modifications and safety assessment program SAP placards. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion in the second, but before we, we go, I just wanna double check with Greg and Jeff. Since we are doing something that's a little bit beyond, do we have to say that we're doing something a little bit beyond? No, that was, that's in the staff report in the presentation, so it, and it's contained in what you're introducing tonight. Fine, great. Um, even though I was really looking forward to having Laura read that whole thing again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, motion and a second. Uh, any discussion or comments? If not, Crystal, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Palmer Lohan? Yes. Councilmember McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Councilmember Rack? Yes. Motion passes. Um, we have another motion, I think, uh, here as well that can be made. Laura's on a roll, so. Uh, right. Uh, I move to introduce ordinance number 1554. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending San Carlos Municipal Code section 15.040.110 California Fire Code to adopt the 2018 edition of the International Fire Code and the 2019 California Fire Code including all adopted standards as specified prescribing regulations governing conditions hazardous to life and property from fire hazardous materials or explosion, and for providing the fire safety inspection process for hazardous uses or operations and establishing a Bureau of Fire Prevention San Carlos Fire Ordinance. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion or comment? Uh, through the chair, there's just one, uh, there was one typographic error that I've been informed uh, at um, page 82 of your packet the, uh, the reference to chapter four emergency planning and preparedness uh, should be deleted and the reference to, sec the reference to section 406.10 should be um, deleted and 406, uh, excuse me, and replaced with 321 is the correct number. There's just a little type, couple typos there. Um, rather than redo the entire motion, Greg, can I just ask if it's acceptable to Laura and to, I think, who seconded, Ron? I did, yeah. If it's acceptable to the mover and seconder, the amendment? It's acceptable. Yes. That okay. All right, uh, Crystal, please call the roll. Council Member Obert? Yes. Council Member Palmer Lohan? Yes. Council Member McDowell? Yes. Council Member Rack? Yes. And Council Member Collins? Yes. All right. Um, Can we take a five minute recess? I was just going to suggest that. No, that's okay. We're going to take a five minute recess. We'll reconvene at 918.
We are reconvened, only a minute late, that's not bad. Um, we'll move on to item 10B, B. consideration of introducing an ordinance amending San Carlos Municipal Code Chapter 2.24, commissions and adopting resolutions approving the updated commissioner's handbook and the Youth Advisory Council bylaws. Okay, good evening Chair Obert and Council, Krista Moy, your city clerk. Um, so the city has established eight commissions committees that support the council. Since June 10th of this year, council has held three study sessions to review the commission's roles and to discuss ways to encourage and ensure the consistent attendance of commissioners at their meetings. Council provided directions at these study sessions and those are outlined in uh, the following slides here. I know you have a copy of all these slides so I'll kind of pass through quickly. The only real updates that we haven't discussed in the study sessions, I wanna mention this right here, the Economic Development Advisory Commission. Um, so the code currently states that the, this commission has an, uh, is a nine member board. Uh, the commission has had only seven members since 2012. So staff is recommending tonight to update the code to formally reduce it to a seven member commission. Uh, so all the the updates that were on these slides are reflected in the municipal code and or the commissioner's handbook. Um, I also wanted to mention that there were a few clerical oversights that were brought to my attention this morning from Councilmember McDowell, so thank you for, for uh, bringing those up. I'll be sure to fix those, and I also appreciate the suggestion on expanding the conflict of interest section in the handbook to include what uh, many people know as the 500 foot rule. So uh, I'd like to work with our city attorney to include recent languages to that law and include that in the handbook. So um, that currently isn't in the handbook that was provided to you in the, in the packet, but uh, I'd like to include that. Um, the Youth Advisory Council bylaws. So um, tonight staff's also recommending that, recommending that council formally adopt the Youth Advisory Council bylaws as they have not been updated since 1992. Um, and then the requested updates are listed here. It's also uh, outlined in the staff report that we provided. And so these are the recommended actions from uh, that council, that staff is requesting of council tonight. Um, interested in hearing any other feedback that you want to provide or, um, and, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Crystal, for all of your hard work on the handbook. I think it's really fantastic and a huge upgrade, so thank you for that. I have three things that I wanted to um, throw out to my fellow council members. The first is about EDAC, shocker. The first thing that I'd like to talk about is um, EDAC, the Economic Development Advisory Commission. Um, in section B, it says that the selection of commissioners, in the selection of commissioners, the city council should seek to have a majority of the commissioners be San Carlos business owners who need not be residents of the city of San Carlos. And given that we've just uh, gone through the interview process for EDAC commissioners, um, and we had several really strong candidates, but not everyone was business owners. Uh, I personally would like to see a change to that sentence saying something to the effect of, um, you know, it's encouraged to try to appoint commissioners who are business owners, but I have a problem with the majority um, word because I think that then you could be leaving out some really qualified candidates who are not business owners. Um, and for example, in the paragraph before that, it talks about how EDAC works on housing and we appointed a really wonderful housing expert as a commissioner in our last round of interviews. And I wouldn't wanna leave out people like that um, in order to fulfill the majority business owner requirement. Um, do you mind if I ask a question mm -hmm. on top of that, just to staff? Um, uh, Jeff, uh, or whoever's appropriate, can, can you enlighten us as to what the purpose of that constraint is. I have to admit, I, I miss that, and it's, it's, I'm almost like, why do we even have the constraint at all? We don't do that with our other commissions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, it was a, 
the desire of the council when EDAC was first formed that it represent, um, did it have a sort of a over representation of business owners? The feeling there being that all of your commissions are staffed by residents. The city council is staffed by residents. Um, you know, the democratic process is really dominated by the voters who are residents of the community, but EDAC was really designed to be uh, an engagement tool with the business community. Um, and so I think that, that that was the desire to make sure that that was represented. However, the practice over the years has been that it's very difficult to get business owners who have the time and interest in volunteering on EDAC. And so while that's been an aspirational goal, I'm not sure that it's one that was ever met beyond maybe the first appointment of EDAC members. Um, as long as I've been here, um, there's sort of been an exception to that goal. Every time we've made appointments, we've never quite gotten there. I, I don't want to put words in the mouth of your mouth, uh, Sarah. Personally, I wouldn't mind if we just struck that whole thing just and just said, you know, like we do with everybody else, you have to be a resident of the San Carlos. Um, but that, that's just me. Anyway, you, you, had, you said you had something else you wanted to bring up as well. I have two more things. Do you want us to discuss that first topic first and reach agreement or? Um, yeah, you, I, actually that's not a bad idea. Um, yeah. What other people feel about this, the uh, first item? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think from my perspective, I, 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 the face of the businesses in San Carlos is changing, right? So my guess is we have a lot more businesses in San Carlos where the owner may not necessarily be here, <laughs> right? So I would be in favor of kind of modifying it to say something to the effect of, you know, priority would be given to a business representative, right, who also resides in San Carlos but not necessary, right? Like, so it would kind of, because in my mind, economic development is all about that economic development and it seems like it would be well served to have people who understand the business community here. So that's, maybe there's a way to soften it, but broaden it. Other thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm curious to know, Sarah, what, what sort of language were you thinking of? I think we could say something to the effect of it's encouraged to have business representatives on EDAC, but you know, I just, I have a problem with the majority language. And I remember um, when we had some vacancies on EDAC when I was there, um, we were actually really hoping that someone with real estate background would um, be appointed because you do want a diversity of business experience, whether they're owners or not, right? That's what I was thinking. It, yeah. it sounds to me that there's actually sort of two issues here. One is the issue of the majority of, of business owners or representatives or whatever, and the other is the whether or not there ought to be a residency requirement. Those are sort of two different things. Um, so what's the what's the general sense about that? I mean, what's, what Sarah was proposing was, was uh, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, was that, uh, you know, it's, it's like staff is encouraged. We were, the, the, the council's goal is to try and recruit people who have a business interest, but we, we've gotten rid of the requirement language. And then, uh, Laura, you were saying something more along the line, actually something pretty similar, except you said business owner or business representative mm -hmm. who lived in San Carlos. So. Um, what's, what do people, what I, does the council want sure, to do? I, mean, I, I, I would just try to change it to maybe say, strike the majority on the first part for business owners and maybe say that you can't have a majority of the EDAC be non-residents. So you have to have a majority residents and you have to have, you know, encourage business owners to be a part of it, but not have a majority. Mm -hmm. Not exclusively business owners or Correct. business yeah. representatives. Just, you can say that we should recruit them, but that there's no majority component. Uh, procedural question for Greg and, and Jeff. Um, whatever final tweak we end up making here, is this something that we would be better off giving direction to staff and have you bring it back? Um, or can we do this on the fly? Um, you could do it either way. I, I think you can probably handle this on the fly, though. It's pretty, you know, so at the end of the day, whatever you sort of agree on topic by topic here, the final motion will be to adopt XYZ, including the direction provided to staff as part of this discussion. And then we'll go back through and make those adjustments since this isn't resulting in an ordinance or that kind of change. So. Got it. Um, all right, so there's been various pieces of or specific language structures proposed. Um, 
again, what's the, what's the pleasure of the council? I'm okay with Adam's suggestion. Okay. I'm okay with Adam's suggestion, uh, but I mean, how do you feel about it? Not a majority of business reps. Yeah, I think that's what I said yesterday. Oh, okay, said good. It a little bit differently than he did. That's fine. I just mm -hmm. wanted to check in, mm -hmm. make sure. All right, so we have general consensus on that. We will, uh, when we act on this, staff will make the adjustments to the text so that it reflects that. Okay, thank you. I have two more. May I continue? Of course. Thank you. Um, so under Transportation and Circulation Commission A2, which is packet page 101, uh, their job is to recommend to the city council and staff ways and means for improving traffic and circulation conditions, including bicycle and pedestrian conditions. And here's where I'm gonna talk about and reducing the use of motorized transportation in the city. And um, considering that we now have e-bikes, which can be considered as a form of motorized transportation, I'm wondering if we could change the language to say and encourage the use of alternative modes of transportation in the city. That, I, I like that change. Mm -hmm. Other other reaction? Anybody opposed to that? Uh, I'm good with it. Adam is studying it. That too. Okay. All right. Um. <laughs> Thank you. You're two for two? <laughs> yes. Okay, last one. Uh, packet page 117, commission appointment process, applications. Uh, this talks about how applicants may designate which commissions and our boards they are interested in serving on. So we're changing the process a bit where applicants can apply for several commissions. I'm wondering what you would think if we could allow applicants to rank their choices so that during the interview process, it's a little more clear to us what their first choice might be. If they're, if they're marking down three or four commissions, I think it might be easier for us to appoint. Uh, uh, personally, I, I, I would have no problem with um, the applicants ranking it if, the, you know, if they wish to do so, provided that the council isn't bound to necessarily follow the ranking request because our needs may not match what's, what the rankings are. Yes, indicate preference is fine. Okay. 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 <laughs> Everybody okay with that? Good on this end. All right, three for three. Thanks Anything so else? much. Uh, no, I have comments, but I'll reserve them to the end. Laura. Thank you, Charles. Um, so in the parental leave, we talk about three months. Um, I'd like to add uh, that it could extend to six months with approval. Yes, I, I believe that is is worded in there that, that way. There is a request to extend it. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't catch that. All right, so I, I got mine too then. <laughs> Fair enough. Anything from this side? Bunch of slackers. Okay. Um, all right. Um, any further comments or discussions? Sarah, I know you said you had some comments. I you do. Wanted to I make. have a comment if, if you don't have any questions, Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank staff for incorporating all of our thoughts. I know we went through this several times, and I think that it's a really great handbook, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I will note that our attendance policy has gone from one small paragraph to now almost two full pages. And it is in part to reflect parental leave and the automatic three months plus an extension to six months. So um, I'm really grateful for that. I think it's really important to have a diverse amount of opinions on our commissions. And I think that, um, you know, for several people, leave is, is important to know that that option is out there. So there's leave for military service and um, all sorts of different life events, um, illness in the family, and I think that that's just so important to incorporate into our city documents. So I wanna thank Crystal for doing that. And um, I think that it's just a really great document to use going forward. All right, good. I would certainly concur with all that. And, and again, Crystal, thank you for doing all, all of the work. Um, if there are no further comments, Crystal, if you'd please call the roll. Did we uh, oh, wait introduce it? No, you can't, you can't call the roll because we have no motion. Sorry about that. Ron, I caught myself that time. You, you didn't jump uh, in fast I, enough. It was a, I would have caught you. Uh, so. All right, uh, I will entertain a motion. I move to introduce ordinance number. 1555. 
1555, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending San Carlos Municipal Code, Code Chapter 2.24 Commissions. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further comment or discussion? Uh, this is the place where you would put in the, um, the amendments. With that the were proposed pro amendments. Yes. The proposed yes. amendments. Right. Uh, is the, the move second? And, that, and just, just to specify for the record, it's that the that um, that the majority of the of the um, EDAC commission be residents and not necessarily business owners, but that business owners will be uh, encouraged to be part of that commission, and that for TNC um, we want to change the language to encourage alternative modes of transportation in the city. Yeah, I think the language was business representative. So business representative, yes. okay, we'll yes. make sure that's. Sure. And Sarah, there was a third. And there's thing. a third of the appointment process allowing um, and, applicants. And I think that might be in the neck in the resolution. That's the next item that you're gonna consider. So. Okay. okay. And it is uh, the mover and seconder are okay with that? Yes. Yes, fine. Crystal, you can now call the roll. Councilmember McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. And Councilmember Palmer Lohan? Yes. Did anybody care to make a I'll motion? I'll continue. I move to adopt resolution 2019 81. 81, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos approving updates to the Commissioner's Handbook, including additional information in the conflict of interest section regarding the radius between Commissioner's real property and a project's boundaries. And you probably wish to. And with the additional amendment regarding um, applicants ranking their choices. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second. Any further discussion or comment? Hearing none, Crystal, you may call the roll. Councilmember Rett? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Councilmember Parmer Lohan? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Councilmember McDowell? Yes. Yes. All right, uh, anybody care to make a third motion? I'll go one more time. I move to adopt resolution 2019-82. 82. 82, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos approving the updated Youth Advisory Council bylaws. Second. There is a motion and a second. Any discussion from the floor? Hearing none, Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. Councilmember McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Parmer Lohan? Yes. And Councilmember Collins? Yes. All right. That brings us to item 10C consideration of recommending city selection committee appointments for a seat on the San Mateo County Transportation Authority, SMCTA, and a seat on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, BAA QMD Board. Um, recommendation, uh, how do you want to handle this? Yeah, don't, we probably don't have a staff presentation on this. Right, so it's just the information that was that is provided in front of us. Um, you know, ultimately the purpose here is to uh, uh, guide the vote, not guide, define the vote of uh, our representative, whether that's me or somebody else, uh, in the city selection committee process. So um, if somebody would like to propose a particular candidate and Yes. Go from there. All right. Uh, Chair Albert, I, I, as for the um, Transportation Authority, uh, I'd like to propose that we support Julia Mates from Belmont. Um, I think she's highly qualified. She's, she's done a very good job on Belmont. Uh, I've talked to her quite a bit. She's, she's very active in, you know, in the Council of Cities and she a person that I believe pays attention, and I think she sort of earned the right. So that would be my recommendation. I uh, agree with that. Are, are there's agreement on that side. Is, is there any other candidate that people would like to recommend we consider? Uh, yeah, I, I think they're all uh, great candidates. I would also um, support Julia Mates' uh, request to serve in this role. She seems to have a good handle on what the position is all about and understands the issues on the peninsula uh, quite well. And I think it would be a kind of a fresh perspective on uh, transportation uh, and I'd underscore that aspect of this, so. And I appreciate you noting as I'm sure Ron and Adam would as well, all three of the candidates are great candidates. It's just difficult. It's nice to have a difficult challenge of figuring out who to vote for. Mm -hmm. um, if there are no other uh, proposals or suggestions, then I, uh, I don't know 
Greg and Jeff, do we need to take a vote on this or is it just sufficient for the council representative, whoever that may be, to know that the council's recommendation is that? Well, um, through the chair, we, we have it, um, this set up for you to do a motion um, to, to make, to authorize the, the appropriate vote. Okay. But, but, but the, legally you do not have to do it though, if you just oh, wanna. I, I, that, that's fair, I should have noticed that myself. Thank you, Greg. Um, and I notice it's combined as, as one item. Why don't we, t uh, I think the second one is relatively straightforward, I, I suppose, unless the council chose not to vote on something. Um, I'll, I'll go on record saying that I wholeheartedly support Julia Mates as well, and I will recommend the appointment of Ann Schneider. Um, and certainly I would support both those things as well. Any objections to that? In that case, I will entertain a motion reflecting that if somebody would care to make one. Uh, I'll move to recommend Julia Mate for the seat on the San Mateo County Transportation Authority and Ann Schneider for a seat on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District Board. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further comment or discussion? Hearing none, Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Palmer Lohan? Yes. Councilmember McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Councilmember Olbert? Yes. All right. Um, that brings us to additional council communications and announcements. Um, I actually have two things, but I, well, Sarah, I see you had something you wanted to add, so why don't you start? I'm happy to defer to you first, Mark, no, if you would like no. to go. Chair always goes last. Okay. Or unless the chair decides to go first, which is <laughs> rude, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. okay. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to report that the San Carlos Day of Service was a big success, and I want to thank uh, the council members that were there. And um, I wanted to let you know that this year, 20 projects were completed with the help of almost 500 volunteers. And I know that uh, a lot of uh, staff helped out on that event as well, and I want to thank them uh, for being wonderful partners in that uh, great day of service. And uh, we cleaned up a lot of parks and assembled toiletry kits and. It was um, a wonderful day in our community, and I want to thank the public for participating as well. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to note, uh, and I'm glad that Nicole Scott here is here in the audience because she uh, made this wonderful info sheet on firearm safety, and I thought that um, it was really important that you know we we sit up here and we pass ordinances and we make regulations, and I am, I'm very proud of our work on this, um, our safe storage ordinance for firearms in our community and um, we've been real leaders on that and I'm very proud of that and I think that there's a lot of opportunity to educate the public that this exists and getting this message out to the public so I want to thank Nicole for her hard work on this and um, this flyer is available in City Hall and it's also online on our city website where people can download it and print it out and share it so I wanted to bring that to everyone's attention tonight. Uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention, and uh, I will step out on a limb here and say uh, the council also will thank you for doing that, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, anybody else have other things? As I mentioned, I had two things wrong. Looks like you yeah. Have just to add. one thing. I had the opportunity to to participate in a panel discussion last Friday uh, with the San Mateo. It was sponsored by the Redwood City San Mateo County. Chamber of Commerce, and they had, uh, we uh, participated in a panel of, uh, there were three mayors and, and me. Uh, it was uh, Ray Mueller from Menlo Park, Ian Bain from Redwood City, uh, Davina Hurt from Belmont, and myself, and it was moderated by Gene and Kevin Mullen, and it was, uh, it was a great opportunity to, to share experiences and talk about how our cities are working together and some of our common experiences. So my thanks to the Redwood City, San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce for putting that on. It was a leadership day, I think. Great. Um, Laura. Uh, I just wanted to uh, shout out to the San, San Carlos Chamber of Commerce, the Art and Wine event this weekend. It was the largest I'd ever seen it and um, really great turnout and um, it was super fun volunteering. I know many of you were all there. Uh, so thank you for the uh, great community event. I think it took up an extra block this year if I'm not mistaken. So expanded by about 20% from what I could tell. Adam, did you have anything? Okay. Um, as I mentioned, I had, I had two uh, brief items, uh, one of which is actually just sort of a, a question request for update on when something is coming forward. Um, 
on the uh, in the continuing uh, uh, saga of the Silicon Valley clean water situation that I've talked about before. Um, uh, I just wanted to update the council and the public that um, the uh, a local newspaper, the Daily Post, has had been asking the making public record act request of the Silicon Valley Clean Water, um, and uh, they got to a point where they asked for some information, which uh, the agency was willing to supply, but uh, because it it potentially impinged upon a settlement agreement, I gather, that they had entered into. Um, they notified a third party, the former uh, head of the organization, that they were going to release the information. That individual actually filed an action in Santa Clara. Greg will know which level court it was, but some court in Santa Clara. What, the Superior Court? Superior Court, thank you. Um, it, which is known, uh, something, a new term to me, a reverse Public Records Act request, which is basically when a third party basically goes to a court and says, dear court, please stop the public agency from releasing this information. Um, case has been filed, has not been scheduled for hearing yet, but obviously there'll be further developments there. My understanding is the Daily Post is uh, uh, working to make an argument to be, uh, and Greg here will again know the correct terminology, to be admitted to the suit so that they can, they can participate in the discussions. Um, the question I had uh, from a scheduling point of view is, did we not at some point uh, ask uh, for a process to be undertaken to review the code of conduct? Um, or, or am I hallucinating that? No, it's, we, it's, we did. It's and, in it, process. and that it is in process. I guess the question I have, because we obviously it's not agendized, we can't talk about it, uh, but perhaps staff can enlighten us as to when that might be coming back. I'll, I'll have to check on that. It's just not been on my radar lately, so I don't want to give you a, a bad answer, but I'll send an email out to the council tomorrow with an update on where that's at and when it's planning to come to the agenda. That, that would be fine. I appreciate that. And I'll just say, you know, speaking for myself, I wouldn't mind if it took place sometime during my tenure as chair, <laughs> which means you have about two months. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, any other comments or... Jeff, do you have any comments uh, from the staff side? Nothing this evening, Mr. Chair. All right, then we will adjourn our meeting.